facts and raise no objections subject to a condition regarding hydrants. And in terms of biodiversity, the plans demonstrate a green roof. This considered the proposal would not result in a loss of ecology. In conclusion, I recommend approval subject to conditions as outlined in the officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, so, uh, speakers, so Philip, you're first. Um, we're in the room. So, Philip, if you want to sort of take your seat at the public speaker desk and then um, you press the button on the right hand side in front of you, uh, you know, three minutes to speak. And half a minute before the end, uh, James will press the bell so you know you're coming to the end of your time. So if you're, when you're ready, thanks. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, members. Uh, I represent all of the existing residents and homeowners in Adiva Court. Um, to answer the question to start with, why are we here considering this, members may have some recollection of changes to the general permitted development order that came into effect a couple, two and a half years ago now. Um, which allowed for PD, permitted development rights, to put an extra story or two on existing blocks of flats. Because this um, block is within the protection zone for the airport, um, those PD rights don't apply. Now, that doesn't mean then that you sit here and only consider whether there's a risk of an aircraft knocking into this building. All bets are off. Everything is back into the melting plot. You must look at the entire proposal in the round and everything to do with it. Now, in that context, you do have relevant policies in your local plan. Most of them have been referred to in the officer reports to you, but I draw particular attention to uh, policy 52, which is about subdivision of existing dwellings. Now, when that was drafted, uh, nobody in their right minds thought it would be a very good idea to put extra uh, stories on existing blocks of flats. It was really aimed at garden land. Nonetheless, uh, it's a criteria-based policy and includes requirements, amongst other things, for uh, adequate parking provision. And Local Plan Policy 58 deals with altering and extending existing buildings. And amongst other things, it requires that proposals reflect or successfully contrast with existing building form, materials, and everything else, and also that there must be sufficient car parking provided. Now, in that context, what the existing residents say is that the height, scale, and massing of the proposal has a permanent and irreversible adverse impact on the character and appearance of this locality, this very suburban locality. Um, and nothing that the uh, applicant has attempted to do or say will change that. And if you think about it, that's not very surprising because Adiva Court is less than 10 years old. It was at the time quite a controversial um, proposal to redevelop the curtilage of a, a pub um, and it optimized the development of the site and I think that's important to recognize that there's some there's a difference between optimizing a site and maximizing a site maximizing ends up with poor design and in future generations they will look back at some of these roof extensions and they'll be regarded in the same way as the giant box dormers attached to suburban semi-detached dwellings. The choice of materials neither reflects nor contrasts successfully with the existing development, and the absence of adequate car parking means that the, uh, that inadequacy is forced upon the existing residents. There's enough reasons there for the members to not only refuse this application, but to successfully defend that at appeal should that be the way the cookie crumbles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, thank you. So the next speaker is Alan Hanafi, the agent, who I believe is online speaking. Oh, hello, Alan. Good morning. So if you'd like to speak for three minutes, then when you're ready. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alan Hanafi from Union for Planning. And I act as a planning consultant on behalf of the applicant, Avon Grand Rent Limited. The planning application before you is for a proposed development comprising the construction of a single story extension at roof level, accommodating three self-contained flats. The proposed extension will be constructed of grey zinc, which is certified in accordance with fire regulations. Each of the proposed homes will comply with the requirements of the nationally described space standards and will include private external amenity space in the form of balconies. The balconies will have glass balustrades to match the balconies on the existing building, 
with obscured panels used to ensure that the privacy of neighboring residents is protected. The proposed extension is designed in a manner which will provide a high standard of accommodation with all habitable rooms orientated to maximize access to daylight and provide good outlook. The proposed development was subject to pre-application consultation with officers at Cambridge City Council, which helped to inform the detailed design of the scheme. The pre-application advice confirmed that the provision of additional residential flats in an existing residential area is acceptable in principle and in accordance with the policies of the Cambridge Local Plan. The application was also presented at a development control forum at which the design team provided clarifications to a series of queries raised by existing residents of Adiva Court. A representative of the residents suggested in the forum that a brick-faced extension across the full length of the roof would be the residents' preference. We welcomed this positive suggestion, but agreed with officers that incorporating a setback from the parapet of the existing building would reduce the scale and massing of the proposed extension. Moreover, we agreed with officers that the proposed grey zinc material would provide a more lightweight appearance which would contrast with the existing building and complement the roof materials of the neighbouring Dunstan Court. The applicant and design team took on board the comments received during the Development Control Forum and made some key design amendments. In addition, a draft environment, construction and environmental management plan was submitted, setting out mitigation measures to reduce any impacts during the construction phase. The proposed development is considered acceptable by the Council's highways team in terms of highway safety and the proposed car and cycle parking provision. Furthermore, no objections have been raised by any of the statutory consultees. To conclude, the planning application accords with the policies of the Council's development plan and is supported by national and local policies for housing. We would respectfully ask you to support the recommendation of your officers and grant planning permission for this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome to carry on listening, but if you want to turn your camera off now, then please. Next to speak is Councillor Davies, Ward Councillor. You okay there? I'm sure you will be coming up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, I'm here to object to this application and speak in support of the existing residents in uh, Adiba Court. Um, I found it interesting that, that the officer commented that um, there are no changes to the existing flats. I think it, uh, it requires a level of um, dis suspension of belief to, to think that having the roof taken off your building and uh, living through that process brings no changes. Um, and I would absolutely reinforce what uh, Mr. Krantz said about the optimization versus the maximization of the plot. This is a plot I'm very familiar with. I think I probably contributed to the planning application when this was first built. And if we believe uh, all of the statements we make about Cambridge City Council having a commitment to uh, approving delivery of housing designed and built to a high standard, then we have to be confident that when Adiba Court received permission a decade ago, the scale and design were optimised for the plot, and therefore anything that further increases the density there uh, with the accompanying changes to access arrangements, car parking, bin store, etc. This, this is over development. Um, and this application to overdevelop the site has proceeded really without consultation with the owners of the existing flats, um, who... Uh, first found out what was planned when contractors employed by the applicant entered the premises and set off an alarm. If there'd been any meaningful consultation with the existing residents, um, the mistake which necessitated the issuing of the amendment sheet uh, would not have occurred because the issue would have been picked up beforehand. And I'd ask members to consider the implications of approving an application where not only has there been no consultation, but where it's being progressed expressly against their wishes. Um, the, the comments which were just made about the conduct of the Development Control Forum don't entirely conform with my recollection of that 
event. Um, members who attended that and are here today may be able to draw their own conclusions. Um, if you look at paragraph 132 of the MPPF, it says, design quality should be considered throughout the evolution and assessment of individual proposals. Early discussion between applicants, the local authority and local community about the design and style of emerging schemes is important for clarifying expectations and reconciling local and commercial interests. Applicants should work closely with those affected by the proposals to evolve designs that take account of the views of the community. Today's application has sadly fallen very short of that expectation. So we're now in a situation which is both unfair and unreasonable to the existing owners because this category of application was not foreseen when the local plan was drafted. The local plan talks about neighbouring occupiers, but that's a phrase which underplays the dominant stake which the existing owners have in the future of this building due to their interests, which they purchased in good faith. They own about 80% of the value and square footage of the property and therefore have a controlling interest in the estate yet their quality of life is now being threatened by a development from which they do not benefit and they do not want. The key principle is that the applicant as freeholder must not derogate from his grant. In other words, the leaseholders must not be left, left with something less than when they bought their property or have their enjoyment of the property interfered with. And this application seeks to do just that. Mr. Krantz has outlined a range of material planning concerns. I would also ask committee members to put themselves in the position of the existing owners. Faced with the impacts of these concerns, would the enjoyment of their properties hindered not just temporarily by construction noise starting at 8 a.m. six days a week above their heads and by scaffolding enveloping the building and casting their flats into darkness, but permanently due to the internal and external changes which the applicant seeks to make to the estate against their will. Imagine the impact on your peace of mind of an informat of informative three, not a condition, an informative, which currently reads, where the proposed new dwelling cannot meet access requirements for fire appliances, compensatory features should be provided. I'd ask you what reassurance that offers existing owners I'd also like to um, comment on the parking arrangements for this. Um, the officer acknowledged that this will increase on-street parking demand. And from my own work with the residents of the council-owned bungalows immediately opposite the site on Wolfston Way, I know the parking pressure for residents there who have mobility issues and who are disabled. And I would argue that anything that increases parking pressure for on-street spaces in this location is extremely problematic. Um, highway safety is not the only issue here. Treatment of this application will likely set a precedent for a slew of future such applications in the city. I would ask committee members to uphold their commitment to strategic objective 15 as laid out in the local plan to promote a safe and healthy environment, minimizing the impacts of development and ensuring quality of life and place. The only way this can be achieved is by rejecting this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So just to be clear, Councillor Davies is a, a member of planning committee because she's spoken on that item. She won't now be taking part in this debate on this item. So over to councillors in planning committee for questions or debate. Councillor Thornborough. Um, I know that the um, the we've had uh, the consultees have said that it doesn't need to comply with M42 because it's an existing building, but we do have policy fifty six which is um, uh, creating successful places, there's a requirement that proposals need to meet the principles of inclusive design, in particular the needs of disabled people, the elderly and those with children. And I'm particularly concerned that the generous stairwell of the existing building becomes a very narrow stair leading up to the top floor and a very small landing at the top on which there's three entrance doors into the new flats. And I wondered if that is, can actually be 
um, can we say that that has been designed for inclusive, that to on the principles of inclusive design? So does that small landing uh, meet the needs of disabled people, elderly, and those of uh, young children? That's one con uh, real concern I have. Um, I would like to know what the case officer's um, comments on the consultation issue raised by the ward councillor um, in, in connection with paragraph 132 of NPPF and consultation is important. Has there been no consultation? Um, and I've, if, we, if this does go, I also note that there is a drawing in our pack showing the horizontal fire compartmentation. There's a, there's a drawing in our pack showing the horizontal fire compartmentation of the new proposed top floor. But I'm concerned that we haven't got information about the horizontal fire compartmentation. So it's the, the existing building, it's very, the, the load-bearing walls are structural, um, the fire compartmentation, because of the corridors and the stairwell, the generous stairwells, is the fire compartmentation. But at the top floor, the, the, the compartmentation changes. And I, we should be certain that the, the compartmentation between the existing top floor and the proposed top floor is, does work. So if this were to be approved, I would like to seek that that was a condition. And there's something else I would like to seek as a condition as well. And that would be um, the, the water usage on these top floor flats would need to be separate meters so that they could be, they could be individually monitored and not one rising mains um, teeing off to the flats. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. There's a lot there. Uh, you spoke about uh, compartmentalisa compartmentalisation for fire, I think. So um, I don't know if Councillor Bajan, I know you have a point on that too. Do you want to make that point now and then we'll go back to Charlotte and then she can deal with those that list of questions first? Councillor yes. Bajan. Yes, Chair. May not be a planning matter, but feel needs to be raised. The, the smoke lobby at the top of the stairs as a door opening onto the staircase, which is shown as opening inwards. And I think that's wrong. I think it has to open outwards. And it may be that in achieving that, in achieving the required space on in that lobby, it may affect the whole planning design of the upstairs. I want to raise that to hope that it can be at least a point made to the building, the building department control maybe to the fire service, asking them why did they not draw attention to this. But I, I have a grave concern that there's a lot going on in that lobby at the top of the staircase. Are you finished, Councillor? Yep. Thank you. Okay. So just to be clear to everyone, I think Councillor Bajant was referring to the door should open in the direction of travel in terms of fire escape. So, Charlotte, do you want to pick up those questions first, and then we'll go back to further questions from councillors, please? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, in terms of the fire kind of concerns, I believe the building control officer did mention something about the extern external corner detail, if that's um, what Councillor Thornborough was referring to. And she did. They did have some concerns about cavity barriers, but this, all of these kind of elements, will be checked at building control, kind of the stage, because it's not high enough um, to meet the requirements for it to be considered under planning. There's kind of little that we can do, but everything would be checked at building control level. Um, and in terms of the inclusive design. It's a, it's a kind of strange situation that is because it's on an existing building. It can be hard to enforce things like lifts um, to ensure kind of better inclusivity. Um, so I kind of hands are a little bit tied on that because building 
control do, do not require it. And in terms of the smoke lobby, just bring share my screen again just to confirm which door councillor Bajan was referring to. Um, was it the door from the stairs into the lobby rather than the doors? So Charlotte, can you make that image, the plan image, a bit a bigger part of the screen so that we can all see that a bit better if possible? You know, I'll just bring up the plan. Not cancer, just refer to you know the, the printed pages that we have in the room if you haven't got one. I'll bring up the, the separate fire plan. Um, if it was, I assume it probably was this door that Councillor Bajant was referring to? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not, again, it's going to come down to building control in terms of whether that's, that door's going the wrong way. Um, and probably architectural knowledge as to whether that will force a change of plans. I think that was all the questions so far. Yep. Me if I'm Thanks, wrong. Charlotte. Um, so, um, uh, uh, I... Right. I had a query about consultation. Is it, is it a new question, Councillor? No, no, it's my, my previous question. Okay, right, been we'll answered. fix that for us then. So, Councillor Thornborough wants to come back on something, Charlotte. So, go on. Yeah, I, uh, I remember now the consultation. Um, yeah, the MPPF does recommend um, pre consultation with neighbours that are going to be um, affected by the proposal. However, this kind of is more advice. I don't, I, from what I understand, and the applicants and agent didn't consult the existing um, owners and occupiers of a diva court. I haven't heard anything to the contrary of that. Um, but it can be very difficult to refuse an application due to lack of consultation prior to the planning application. Hey, thanks, Charlotte. So consultation is encouraged by the MPP. F, so National Planning Policy Framework, that's the government legislation on planning, but it, it's, that's as far as it goes, it's encouraged and it appears not to have happened here. Toby, you want to speak on the uh, fire safety matter? Thanks Chair, I just want to make sure that committee is, is having the right focus in terms of planning matters. So the committee sometimes does have a tendency to stray into other matters that are strictly strictly kind of building control and that that's certainly the case in terms of that internal layout the the, the way that the the, the doors open etc et and compartmentalization issues they they are not for um members of the planning committee they are clearly for um building regulations to resolve so um we we could put in um informatives um to remind the applicant of their, their, their duties with regard and our concerns with regard to those issues, but we cannot go any, any further at, at all. So thanks, Toby. You're, you're right to bring that up. We've had this discussion on another item in planning committee before, and when that happened, we decided the best thing to do was to send a message to building control of our concerns, and especially with regard to Councillor Bajan, who is a retired firefighter, so we're very, you know, very happy and pleased to have him on this committee uh, to point out such things that can then go on, on to building control, so I think it's all good. So further questions, councillors? Councillor Walthrop Wood, were you going to ask something? Yes. I was going to ask if we could have an informative uh, about the fire plan, um, setting out some of the issues that have been raised today. Um, I was also a bit confused about the removal of pit permitted development um, order or, you know, not allowing development. And, and if Charlotte could explain that, please. Um, and I'd still worry, you know, about this inclusivity, inclusive building and the lack of a lift and the narrowness of the corridors at the, on this new floor. Um, 
And the other thing I was just going to ask about, okay, the amenity in terms of balconies, we've already got a situation, you know, with repeating what is on the other floors, but does that, is that a justification for agreeing to this application? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> More questions? Yes, Councillor Pora. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was also going to raise paragraph 8.48, the balconies. This is being assessed under the current local plan. There should be play space for children. So I am concerned that the officer has noted that this isn't sufficient. And I know there's a park nearby, but the local plan makes very clear we can't rely on things being nearby. It needs to be provided on site. Um, to me, this is a bit... I think the officer's right. On balance, a lot of these things aren't enough to reject, but there's quite a lot of things for me that worry me. So obviously there's no affordable housing. I understand that. It's because it's coming in two parts. But again, that's another bit of the local plan that's sort of missing. The thing that worries me the most is paragraph 840. We are being asked to approve a bedroom with only one window that's obscured glass. I don't think I've ever sat on planning committee where we've been asked to approve a bedroom or you know, usable room with no window. So I'd be really grateful because to me that that's just an absolute no-no. And I appreciate, as the officer has said, it's only one window. And I'd be grateful also if she could bring up the plan and actually show me which of those bedrooms it is. Because there, there must be a better solution than obscuring it. I mean, the gardens are quite long and the houses are further away. But, so whether we don't obscure it, but I understand that leads to overlooking. But we can't be obscuring a bedroom window. That just seems like really against everything in the local plan. And then... Um, I wonder if the officer could comment, or Toby, on the construction process. So I know that we'll be told, obviously, it's not a material grounds because it's temporary. But I know from a similar one in my ward, where uh, this was a while ago, where an extra floor was put on, the disruption and the mud and the stuff just going up and down, up and down all day for months was very disruptive. So I'd be grateful if the officer could comment on how we could strengthen conditions, because I don't think a normal construction management plan probably addresses this, because it, even if it's not at material planning grounds, we need to help residents live through this. And I would also like to note, because the applicant's listening, I am really disappointed to find no consultation with people who own, as I understand it, leaseholds in that building. Because, you know, to me, that's really poor practice and also will lead to committees like this, where residents are understandably wanting to raise their views because they've got to live in this building as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor. Just have one more Councillor questions, and then we'll go back to Charlotte. So, Councillor Collis. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Bennett also has a question after me. Um, just echoing the concerns about lack of consultation. You know, I appreciate that that's advisory. It's not a requirement. But it is such you know, likely to prove such a disruption to local residents. I'd like to understand why and how that consultation hasn't happened. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. If you don't mind, Councillor Ben, I'm going to go back to the officer now because there's too much otherwise to answer. And, um, yeah, so if you could answer those questions, then please, Charlotte, and we'll come back with a few more questions after that. Right, thank you. Um, so, yeah, as Toby said, or the strongest we can do in terms of the fire safety is add informatives. Um, there is currently one on there, um, and I believe if that needs to be strengthened or some additional information in there, um, we would be, that could be done. Um, in terms of the removal of PD rights, um, what the speaker said previously was correct. It's within the, it's close enough to Cambridge Airport that that removes the PD rights for adding an additional floor to to the building. So they cannot apply um, for prior approval to add the floor, which is why this has come in as a full planning application. Um, it's just kind of raised about inclusivity and the narrowness. Um, not sure if there's necessarily a question about that. Um, amenity is probably reviewed with the lack of play space in terms of because the exist because of the existing situation with the other flats in a diva court it would be i would consider it would be a difficult refusal reason to hold up at appeal 
um, Toby might correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, in terms of the window, let me just bring up the plan. Uh, so in particular, it's this window in particular. So it is serving a small bedroom. Um, so it's like a Charlotte, if possible. I can't on a day. Just wiggle, wiggle it around a bit more then, so everyone can definitely see which one you mean. Okay, thank you. Um, it's likely to, as it's probably only going to be used for sleeping because it's so small, and likely to be the spare room. That's why, on balance, having it obscurely glazed would work. It would allow light. It wouldn't allow outlook, but it would allow natural light into that room. Um, in terms of the construction process and disruption, um, they have submitted their quite a detailed construction environmental management plan. Uh, this this was reviewed by our environmental health officers and we kind of taking their expertise that it is sufficient in this case, although it is noted that there will be disruption. And in I, unfortunately, I can't answer about why there was a lack of consultation. I think that was everything. Thanks, Charlotte. Anything wasn't picked up, councillors? Okay. So, uh, Councillor Bennett, you had some questions. Thank you, Chair. I do indeed. Uh, I'd like to start with the bee roof. Um, normally, when we see bee roofs, uh, they're on uh, cycle shelters, uh, bin stores, and other uh, single storey buildings and one of the reasons why this is important is because a bee roof isn't just planted it needs regular maintenance which means getting up there with heavy tools. I cannot see that there is any suitable access to the roof here. It's obvious from the design of the stairwell that the stairs do not go up to the roof. Um, so I cannot see how the bee roof can be maintained, which means that the bio proposed biodiversity gain from the bee roof will be lost. I also note that um, a bee if the bee roof is to be maintained, that's quite expensive, and that cost is going to fall on the leaseholders who will yet not have access to that roof. Um, so that is also a concern. Um, the other thing I'd like to pick up is parking. I'm actually very familiar with parking here because uh, when I was doing my cancer treatment at Athenbrooks, where I had to attend daily for quite long periods, I could not actually manage to get from the patient car parks to treatment. So I would actually park uh, at Queen Edith's at that you know, and get the bus in because that was fewer steps for me and I did this for three months regularly. Parking is really very difficult there and the, um, I'd also like to now turn to page 18 and 8.44. I note we're talking about um, nine inhabitants um, it seems unlikely that these will appeal to people who are retired or have small children, given that they're second floor and there's only a balcony for in-site play space. So I think we're probably talking about adult sharers. So potentially we have nine people who may need to commute and we have one parking sp space provided. I am aware that you don't need a car to commute. Uh, for some commutes, but certainly not for all of them. And I'm also aware that people who have to commute outside Cambridge will quite often choose areas such as Queen Edith's and Abbey, which have good access to the external road network. So I would like to challenge whether the parking provision of one space for these nine people is truly adequate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. It's got a bit there. I think we'll just go back to you then, Charlotte, for that lot, and then I'll have to say a few things. Uh, in terms of the green roof, um, 
so the conditions which could if um, members would like could possibly be strengthened but um, condition 10 regarding details of the green roof I refer to maintenance as well as condition 9 regarding biodiversity net gain um, again that includes implementation for management and monitoring uh, in terms of the parking um, I did have further discussions a while ago back with highways um, and I think looking at that they submitted a parking survey and that showed there was when the parking survey was taken obviously that's only a snapshot there was kind of spare spaces on the road and that was taken in May 2021 um, at a time where more people were working from home so there was probably further parking stress in the area um, and in, we cannot control whether the occupiers of the res of the flats um, choose to have a car or not. That was kind of the two issues, wasn't it? Parking and green roof. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Charlotte. Um, I think most of the queries that I'd noted down have been asked by other councillors. Just well, just a couple of things. Firstly, in terms of the look of the thing, I mean, it doesn't look too bad, I think. You know, the, the sort of extension to the top of the building, uh, the, the sort of grey area sort of gives a sort of a top to the building, like a sort of, uh, um, you know, like a roof with, in grey. It looks like a sort of roof area. So that's sort of acceptable. Um, I think all, some of the concerns that have been raised have been various. So there are some planning matters there. But there have been other things that have been called areas of concern by councillors, but also things that haven't been named, but they're more civil matters, which, which would be to do with the, um, well, civil matters. So not something that we can really consider here. I think councillors just need, if, they, if you're going to ask any more questions, just try to focus on the planning matters particularly and think about that in terms of, you know, reasons for refusal, if that's the direction you're going in, councillors, because the applicant, the... Um, officer has approved this subject to conditions in terms of the recommendation. So um, just, just one thing there, I wanted to check with you, Charlotte. So it was said by Councillor Davies when she uh, made her um, speech that the leaseholders' rights would be less than what they were, the, the sort of what they had, what they ended up with would, would be less than what, they, what they've got at the moment with this block being built on top of them. And I'm, I've been presuming that's a civil matter, but I just wanted to check that with you, that there wasn't any other way of looking at it. And also just to say that you referred to something called PD, so just so everyone understands that's, that's permitted development. And um, finally, I just wanted to check, again, I'm afraid in terms of fire, but the, the zinc cladding that's going, that's proposed on the top, I'm presuming that's not going to contain any combustible material, and would that be something we'd like to recommend that building control check as well? So just those couple of questions, please, Charlotte. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, the leaseholder concern, that is a civil issue, and it's nothing, we can't um, do anything about that. The zinc cladding and the building control officer did state it achieves an A1 classification for reaction to fire, which is the highest performance. That's based on the information that they provided, um, but I'm sure it's something that if members are looking to approve can let building control know to make sure that it is suitable. Thank you. Okay, thanks Charlotte, that's me done. So I'll just say one thing sort of, uh... In response to what's been said so far some of the things like not having a lift i guess that's in terms of like buyer beware isn't it if someone wants to rent or live or buy one of these flats then they look what they've got like not having a lift and then that's up to them really so i don't feel that this committee can easily decide what a potential inhabitant of the flat wants to have and that's my own common sense sort of approach not necessarily as a 
I'm not a planning officer, obviously. I know there'll be planning concerns, and maybe others will raise those. But, um, I mean, we, we do get some more places for people to live, and that's always a useful thing in a city with, uh, you know, a lot of pressure on, on the, the number of dwellings. So, Councillor Gawthrop Wood, you had your hand up first. Um, this is, yeah, just to be clear, um, in terms of the lack of a lift and inclusivity, and I'm just wondering which of the local plan, um, you know, which number, policy number that came under, is that a sufficient reason to reject the fact that it's not inclusive? The building, the applicant. Yeah, 56, 56k. All right, thanks, Councillor. Um, if you don't mind, Charlotte, I'm going to let Toby answer that question straight away, and then we'll go to Councillor Thornborough. Thanks, Chair. I, I, I don't think that there is a, a policy position that we could hang the, um, <clears throat> the emission of a, a, a lift. Um, certainly against policy 56, there is, there is a, a specific policy with regard to um, M42 that allows for flexibility within existing buildings. And that is exactly how we have applied um, uh, that policy with all proposals that have come forward through DM. Um, I, I think I would say in addition that, you know, there are a number of concerns that members have raised with regard to the proposal um, and officers have taken the view, obviously, in terms of our recommendation on a number of those um, issues. Um, our view is that they don't amount to a clear reason for refusal. Something like parking, for example. You know, members will be aware that we have maximum standards um, for car parking um, uh, provision. I think that might be a difficult position to refuse the application on particularly as the applicants have done a survey which has accompanied the planning application. Something like the green roofs. Green roofs are very commonplace amongst all the buildings that the council um, sees and it's for the applicant to demonstrate how they're going to maintain um, that green roof. Um, lastly, with regard to the window in the spare room that Councillor Pora raised, there might be an opportunity to ensure that that window perhaps above 1.7 metres is um, clear rather than entirely obscure glazed and that would provide a bit more outlook um, for that particular um, uh, person who's using using that room. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Um, just before I go to Councillor Thornborough, can, can you just um, tell us in common sense language what the maximum standards for parking actually means? Because I think it's something that people often misunderstand and it's not a clear thing, is it the way that we don't ask for like a car or parking space for each flat? It's, it's, it's the opposite. Yeah, it, you're quite right, Chair. In fact, kind of mo most councils have minimum standards for car parking provision where, where policies say X number of um, car parking spaces should be provided for, for X number of units. The City Council is very different. It's always had certainly as long as I can remember, um, um, upper limits on the number of car parking spaces that need to be delivered um, as part of um, residential or commercial properties. So the, the concept behind the, uh, the, the policies effectively is to reduce the reliance on um, the private car and uh, the impacts of the private car on um, particularly kind of um, health of the uh, Cambridge's uh, citizens, also in kind of reducing congestion and promoting sustainable um, travel. So um, that's the origin of the, um, that's the origin of the uh, policy and we've been fairly consistent in, 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 in actually kind of a, a, a applying that, that remit within um, schemes that come forward that have limited limited car parking. I note here that we're, we're um, within a local centre as, as, as well. So um, I assume that some residents would be able to get some of their day-to-day -day needs from some of the local shops um, on Wollstone Way. Thank you. Thanks for that, Toby. That's very clear. And I'm just going to say as chair, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what that means, the bottom line, what that means is in this particular application, if, if councillors were, were arguing that there's not enough car parking on this scheme, 
they will be arguing a position that was contrary to our own policy. So, Councillor Thornbury, your turn. Um, I'm, I have real concerns about this scheme, and it, to me, it feels like... I, I, have, I agree with you, Chair, about the external design and the materials. I think I don't have a problem with that. But the existing flats are very carefully designed to be separated by a generous stairwell or um, a shared corridor on all, all floors. At, at, then you come up to this level, there's no separation between the flats and there's a tiny little uh, landing, a very small landing, which all of the eight or nine residents need to go through, plus all the furniture that needs to go through, plus all the deliveries that come. Um, and I, I just feel that this, I, I'm really concerned that this, even though I, I think the concept of it may be acceptable, that this may be um, overdevelopment or trying to fit too much at this level, which results in the issues that uh, Councillor Porra said, there's a bedroom which is not satisfactory and that it's, they're just trying to get too much up at this level. So I'm just, on a, those are my concerns. But I don't know, I'm not, I'm still um, thinking about this up. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Porra. Thank you. I do agree that the look of it for me is, isn't a problem particularly. I, I quite like the slightly set back roof and the different colouring. For me, it comes back to two material grounds. One, the bedroom. I take Toby's point, we could obscure the glass to 1.7, but that still means you can't see out of it. I mean, that's literally the point of it. And it just feels that, you know, we shouldn't be approving tiny bedrooms with a window you can't look out of. That, to me, I think is contrary to our local plan. I can't find the exact policy at the moment, but I'm hoping someone will be able to remind me of it. Um, it does feel, you know, some of these houses we see are, you know, very constrained sites, their list of buildings. You know, this isn't, this is actually quite a generous building. It's a modern building. And I understand that in material grounds, we can't object to there being no lift. I actually agree with Toby on the parking. I welcome the car reduction. But what they're actually doing is shaving off everywhere and they've shaved off on the bedroom and if the other thing that worries me if policy 50 page 172 clearly states there should be areas for children to play and it said there should be high quality shared amenity areas on the site to meet the needs of residents there's none of that here and I appreciate the old flats were consented under the previous local plan where that wasn't a requirement these flats are being consented under the current one so my view is the balcony amenity space and there's no children's play area and this is what I mean, it, everything is just up to the wire. And for me, I suppose the decision is, is there enough of it up to the wire to tip the balance from uh, agree to refuse? And I think that's what worries me. There's just everything has been shaved off. As I think Councillor Thornborough said, the, everything has been compressed in. Whereas actually this was a clean slate. We could have had fewer flats with bigger space, with more windows. We could have had more room for balconies. But the applicant has chosen not to. And for me, I have a real concern about the play area because I think that isn't compliant with local plan. And I think that is a material ground. I'm sure Toby will correct me if I'm wrong. And I also have a concern with that window. Even if we shade, uh, shade it to 1.7, it still means nobody can look out their window. And we should not be agreeing houses with bedrooms with no visibility. We spend hours and other planning committees about overlooking, trying to work this out for people, don't we? Charlotte, could you address those two, I think there were two matters there, of the window at 1.7 metres, I believe that's the bottom of the window, no? bottom or top, perhaps you could confirm, Charlotte, where the 1.7 metres comes to, and also the matter of the lack of play space for children, and just talk about those in terms of planning matters, that would be useful, please, Charlotte. Uh, the 1.7 metres is measured from the finished floor level um, and that's to protect privacy. Um, so some, a normal person um, would not be able to kind of look out unless they were standing on something. Um, Councillor Poor is right in terms of um, policy 50. It does refer to um, two bedroomed properties having um, space for children to play. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, because of the existing situation at Adiva Courts, um, officers consider that it, it may um, be difficult to 
um, at appeal, um, but it, if they were looking to refuse, and Toby again will correct me, it could be a material consideration. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Toby? Thanks, Chair. So, um, in terms of outlook from that um, that one unit that's affected, an, an inspector would look at the overall amenity that the residents have in that unit. I think it'd be very unlikely that one one window serving nominal um, room, single bed room, would would amount to um, a dismissal reason in an inspector's mind. And we've had, I can recall, a number of um, cases where we've tried to challenge particularly kind of obscured outlook from um, properties and developers have been fairly, uh, inspectors have been fairly consistent in, in their approach to amenity in this regard. It's not just about kind of one, one room, it's about overall amenity and there are other aspects available to future occupants of that property. I think um, lack of um, kind of external um, space, play, play space, um, has more material weight in terms of the consideration of the proposal vis-a-vis -vis policy um, 50, as Charlotte said. Um, that is something that officers have kind of weighed in the balance in terms of the recommendation um, being put forward to you. What I'd remind um, members is that um, this scheme is providing additional much needed housing. Um, it's not taking up greenfield land. It's on an existing site and is making the best use of land and national planning policies and um, look in general to support such such proposals. Thank you. Thanks for that, Toby. I know Councillor Collins wants to speak. I'm just going to briefly say something about this window. So, um, I lived in a house with a higher level window in the back bedroom. It would have been about that level, I think, because it would have gone up to the ceiling, which was 2.4 metres. So I believe that you can see out a window at that height. You just have to look diagonally up at the sky. You wouldn't be able to see the horizon or the, you know, the, the view. But you do, you, you know, and I, I know in planning committee, we did once get an application come along with a bedroom with no window in it. And I'd certainly be um, concerned myself for, with a bedroom with no window. But this is a bedroom with a window that opens, but, but with obscure glass. And, um, you know, you have to look up to see the sky. So I think, you know, we have to sort of measure these things in, con you know, sort of make a measure. So anyway, Councillor Collis. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just a um, point of information for colleagues. If it's useful, I checked the map and it's an eight minute walk to Nightingale Wreck. Um, you, have, you have to cross Queenie this way and then walk down Nightingale Avenue. So fairly near but not right round the corner. Thanks. Thank you for that point of information, Councillor Collins. Councillor Bajant. Chair, I'm, I'm coming to the view that not having a, a, a play space for children is, is really a priority here. I think that the argument that you wouldn't want to live on the third floor if you had children, or second, third, yeah, um, is probably right but a lot of people don't get a choice about where they live, and nor do they get a choice of often having lived somewhere when they decide that they're going to have a family or they don't even get a choice about that sometimes. I think this, if this was coming before us as a whole block, we would turn it down on play space, and my inclination is to go in that direction now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, Councillor Bennett. I like to comment on the play space thing because, uh, like Councillor Collis, I'm looking at the map and I'm noticing that you have to cross quite busy roads um, with high speed traffic to get to that. I do not think it would be accessible for a smaller child of, say, under seven um, to access that play space on their own uh, because at that age you don't really have road sense. Um, so we're effectively saying that if an occupant of the top floor uh, has children under seven, that they're restricted to the balcony. 
and I don't think anybody would call that adequate play space. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, Councillor Pora. Just to check my understanding from the officer, looking at the space, I think it's flat 15 is the one that has the window that's obscured. So that's only plus 2.2 over the minimum space standard. So I think for me, if that is the case, then I would look at it together to say there isn't outside play space, there isn't a balcony, and it's barely above the minimum standard with one bedroom that's single without a fully functioning window. I do take the chair's point, you can see the sky, but at my height, I'm struggling to do that, I have to say. I think I'm less than 1.7. Thank you. Okay. Um, my question, uh, Charlotte, is was the access officer consulted on this application? I can't see anything in the report. Um, and obviously, it would be difficult to get to these flats if you were had any sort of impairment, uh, in, if not general, to a certain extent, but generally that's what the access officer can, considers. So, Charlotte, as well as anything else you picked up in terms of questions? Um, Councillor Poirot, just checking the size of Unit 15. Yes, 2.2 square metres above the minimum of the government's technical housing standards. And I don't have any comments from the access officer. Um, my system has just gone down to double check whether they they were consulted. Um, but th I definitely do not have any comments from the access officer to confirm that. With me. So just pushing you on that then, Charlotte, where are we with that then in terms of access to these flats? I mean, is it because it's a development on an existing development that we can't pushed up particularly hard or not? Because some people aren't going to be able to get to these flats, are they? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's policy 51 that refers to um, housing development should be of a size, configuration and layout to enable building regulations requirement M42. Um, but the building control officer has confirmed because it's an existing um, building, there's some flexibility in terms of M42. For example, the lift is not required. Thanks, Charlotte. Any more questions? No, I think we've had a good session on that, really, haven't we? So, um, anything not clear, councillors? Righty ho. So, um, Toby, can we have the recommendation, please, and we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Chair. So, the recommendation set out on page. 20 of the reports pack and that is to um, approve the application subject to the conditions as set out and subject to um, additional informatives as discussed with regard to um, fire escape compartmentalization and cladding and a specific condition with regard to the treatment of the bedroom window on the upper floor side of um, one of the residential units. Thank you, Chair. So we're in the middle of voting. What yeah. is it? it I, I asked that if there should be an amendment to condition 15 to say that the that they need to be separate, separately measurable for water consumption because we're finding flats have one water meter for all the flats and it's really important that they've got separate meters and that condition 15 doesn't stipulate that we've we've raised this i've raised this at other committee meetings thank you councillor i mean no one spoke against that so i presume we can add that on did you want to add that on toby we we can accommodate that request chair okay that's done then councillor so that was the recommendation the uh officer recommendation is one to approve all those in favor of that recommendation Three support, Chair. Are those against? Four against, Chair. So, so uh, that's I against. I'm against the officer recommendation. So we need to um, put together some reasons for refusal now. So just to be clear, everyone, uh, we need to get the right form of words on that in terms of what's been discussed by councillors so far. And um, would, so we just have a chance now for councillors to sort of feed into that process. Then we'll have a a break and councillors, the officers will put that form of words together. So, councillors, uh, Councillor Wolfrat Wood first. 
I apologise about this. I thought we were voting on the condition. I vote against the proposal. That's fine, Councillor. Don't worry. It wasn't quite clear, was it? That's absolutely fine. So um, uh, it was slightly confusing because we uh, had a dis short discussion during the voting session. It wasn't Councillor Th uh, Thornborough's fault. It, she was doing the very, very correct thing of drawing that to our attention. So we, we have now got that condition that she talked about earlier in the set of conditions that we will now vote on. So we'll have that vote again. So the recommendation from officers is to approve. And I'm going to ask councillors to vote now on whether they support that recommendation of approval for this item. It's now gone down to two in favour, Chair. Two. OK, those against that recommendation? Five against, Chair. So the uh, recommendation falls and uh, we need to put together the form of words. So, councillors, can you assist at all in any... Uh, yes, Councillor Porham. Yeah, for me, it was the... I think it's policy 50... Oh, I wrote it down. 50, I think, uh, about the children's play. But I think particularly combined with the fact that the single bedroom, so that's the children's bedroom, would have the obscured or partially obscured window the balcony isn't enough and that there is no, no place, no, nothing other than car parking spaces on the site. So it was sort of a cumulative, you know, it wasn't just to say just because there wasn't play space, but there just weren't any other options. And the fact that it's only 2.2 metres over the space standard as it is. Um, oh, I've lost my, I wrote down loads of reasons, but now I can't find them. Um, yeah, and the, wi the window for me on its own, I think, isn't compliant with the local plan to have an obscured window in a bedroom anyway. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? Councillor Bajan. Chair, I, my concern is place based, simple and, and, and straightforward, but I don't know how much subjectivity we put behind that when we give it as a reason. But this is the 21st century. And we should not be allowing premises to be built where there is no play space for children. We have enough problems with civic amenities for our younger generations. And it isn't only about young people. Not having anywhere green to sit within the site is just so outdated. But that's a subjective view, of course, not a clear planning term. But we may want to make mention to that. Yes and no, Councillor. I mean, we have it in policy, but it's just that this is a refurbished or sort of an addition to an existing property. That's that's the, the rub here. Any more, Councillor Porra? I suppose just to add that, unlike many conversions, this isn't a constrained site. You know, there, there weren't buildings next to it that meant you couldn't put bigger balconies on. So I'll, I'll leave it to Toby to work out how to phrase that better. But, you know, this was a clean slate, so there could have been larger rooms, there could have been windows rearranged, and there could have been more space. You know, I can't see any reason to... There's no reason that couldn't have happened, unlike in some sites where we have agreed slightly smaller mean space because there's maybe a building next door or they've got... It's listed. So, just to infill what people are thinking, so it, it, it's not the, the number of reasons, it's the quality of reasons. So we don't need to sort of rack our brains to think of a long list of reasons for refusal. We just need to think of the best one, one or ones. Councillor Gorfrotwood. Well, again, this is the accretion of things that seem to be a bit wrong. So I, I hope Toby would be able to word it properly. But I am still concerned about the access to the top floor, this new floor, uh, the narrowness of the corridors, the lack of space. Um, you know, we've got turning circles shown inside the flats, but it's that bit getting getting to the front doors of the flats and the, and the stairway. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid concern that was spoken about earlier, and I think that might be something that we might want to include in reasons to refuse. Your microphone's still on, Councillor. OK, anything else? Some councillors... I mean, I voted the other way, but um, some councillors spoke about the building itself, the building site itself being built and in mess and disturbance to residents during that process. Um, I'm presuming we can't really include that there if there's a building um, condition in the application, but we can consider that. Um, 
can't see anything else in my notes of any many there are many concerns but very few you know hardcore um planning matters and um i think that that's that's what's going on here so but the concerns were very very you know they were definitely there and there were lots of them so i'm not belittling them chair i think the other policy 50s being mentioned which is probably the key policy but the other policies probably worth considering are policies 56 creating successful places and policy 59 designing landscape in the public um, realm but i think we've got an, an, enough to um, uh, take a short recess and draft some reasons for recusal thank you chair so just to be clear officers will go away with put the form of words together, come back, we'll look at those, and if councillors need to adjust those or add to them, we can still do it at that stage before we finish for this item. So, Toby, what do you want to do? Ten minutes, quarter past? Something like that? Quarter past. Yeah. We can, so if we come back at quarter past twelve, then, please, councillors, to, look, to um, hear the form of words that officers put together. And um, please don't discuss the item whilst we're, we're having a break, because we're, we haven't made a decision yet. So don't discuss it amongst yourselves or with members of the public or anyone else for that matter. Thank you very much.
Okay, welcome back to Planning Committee. Um, so, uh, we've got a form of words together now. So, uh, Toby, I think you're going to introduce those, um, please. Thanks, Chair. Hopefully, everyone can see um, the words on the display. I shall read it out. Um, the proposed scheme fails to provide high quality shared or private external amenity space for future residents, including for children, and in combination with the constrained and restricted access and layout of the apartments, including limited outlook for bedroom two of flat 15 and lack of inclusive access, would result in an overall poor standard of residential amenity contrary to Cambridge local plan 2018 policies 50, 56 and 59. Thank you, Toby. Councillors, any comments you have even about? Use your microphone, please, Councillor. Sorry. Do we have to, but not limited to children? I was always told to do that when I was drafting. Do you want to expand on what point you're trying to make? I think I understand. Okay. If you say in, if you say including children, that is normally construed as meaning only children. So you need to say including but not limited children. It's just one of those lawyer bo boilerplate things. Yeah, uh, the thing I was thinking, you, you could have um, uh, someone in your family who's disabled, who's not a child, but would need play space maybe uh, something like that. So I, I agree with you, Councillor. Any other comments? I don't know what Toby thinks of that, whether you agree. He's put it in, I think. Yeah, that's all good. If we're all okay with that then, Councillors, okay. So um, what do we need to do now? We need to... Chair, through you, we need to vote on the reason, then we need a substantive vote. Um, someone would need to put forward a motion, I'm assuming, to refuse the application for the, the reason. Thank you. And that would need to be seconded. So firstly, a vote on this reason for refusal. Uh, sorry, Councillor Power. We need a two and not a four. I think it needs to say including but not limited to children, just because we've changed the grammar slightly. But just to be really pedantic. But... No, 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 don't say that. That's all good. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, that's done. Yep. So we're voting now uh, to support the, the reason for refusal. All those in favour of this reason for refusal? Seven zero. All vote. All councillors voting to accept the reasons for refusal, that's and all. then it's do you want to take it forward as a reason for refusal? Because all we've done is we're in neutral at the minute. We've gone against us a recommendation. Now councillors have accepted this form of wording as a potential minded to refusal. And then it's, do you want to refuse the application? Always good to have us explained to us by an officer. Thank you, James. So uh, the next vote is to refuse the item for, the, for this reason. So all those in favour of refusing this item. Seven. Thank you very much, councillors. So uh, that's a uh, um, um, decision to refuse the item. So um, uh, we've just had a bit of a break. I don't think we need a break now, do we really? So we'll just go on. Now, um, the next item is item six, um, which has no speakers. And uh, we've gone over time really on this one in terms of what we've put online uh, and printed. So I think the best thing to do, as we have all the speakers here ready and waiting and have been waiting for a while on, on item seven, that's Milton Road, I think let's get going on that one now, um, do that, and then hopefully we can have a lunch break at the end of that, um, if possible. It depends how long it takes, but um, unless we have to stop in the middle. But th that's the plan anyway. Let's do item seven next and then item six after that. Councillor Bajant. Okay, right, okay then. So um, item seven, uh, I, think, I think the speakers are outside at the moment, but... Um, do you want to call them in, please, Councillor? Thank you very much, Councillor Collis. And um, uh, the officer is Jane Rodins. Jane's here, I think, in person somewhere, I thought. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. And, um, uh, and 
So the speakers, we've got um, Maureen Mace, objector, and I think that's all, is it, James, on my list? Just Maureen? There should be one objector. Um, the other person is here, but not speaking, I believe, Chair. <laughs> so, Maureen, you're here. It's just you to speak, is it? Okay, well, I think you might have gone for a cup of tea. Don't worry. We've got a bit to get before we get to that stage anyway, so he'll probably be back by then. So, um, in that case, we'll start with the presentation, I think. I should be okay without Brian Clark here. Without Brian Clark here, you're here. And um, then uh, we'll go to the speakers. So, just to be clear, you were outside when I said it. We're going to do this item seven first because you're here ready to speak, and then do item six later, after uh, probably after lunch. So, um, Jane, if you want to present the item then, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, previously in terms of amendments, the application, there have been several late representations. This was one from number 344 Milton Road, and one from 362 Milton Road. These were received uh, before the previous committee, the 10th of January. One representation which was submitted and uploaded is for one of the people registered to speak. The other relates to the revised ownership. Jane, I am sorry. I forgot sorry. to say something, and it's yep. important. So just to say, um, uh, it was said before that myself, Councillor Smart and Councillor Gawthrop would, would not be taking part in debate on this item, but a mistake was made, and we will be, making, uh, we will be engaging in debate and voting on this item because we have not visited the site with uh, an objector without an officer. That was the case for a, another application, but not for this application. This, that, that was a different size altogether, and it was just that it was also on Milton Road. So we're, we're all good to be councillors on the committee on this item. So sorry to interrupt, Jane. So this application before members today is to seek planning permission for the demolition of an existing double garage and the erection of bungalow-style dwelling in its place at 346 Milton Way. The officer recommendation for the application is approval subject to the 15 conditions are in part 10 of the delegated report. The application site is located in the rear garden of the host dwelling of number 346 Milton Way. Access will be gained from a single uh, access track to the rear which adjoins Kendall Way to the northeast as shown on the local location plan in front of yourselves. Here's an aerial view of the site. Application is before members, as it's between one to nine dwellings, and there are third party representations that cannot be res resolved by a planning condition. Uh, the main considerations of this application are the impact on the character of the area, impact on neighbour amenity, highways, car parking, and cycle parking. Side five, uh, here are the existing and proposed site plans. As you can see from the proposed site plan, there is a bungalow star dwelling to the north that was approved in February 2020. Uh, here are the elevations of the proposal. Uh, site visit photos. Um, so the one on the left is taken towards the garage that's currently on the site. Photo two is taken towards the main building on the site. On the right, you can see the neighbouring bungalow, as previously mentioned. Photo on the left is the front of the neighbouring bungalow, and photo four is the side flank bungalow on looking up from the proposed site. And this is along the access trackway towards Kendall Way. Main considerations is there's no objection from the local highways authority, no objections from environmental health, um, none from the sustainable drainage officer, and there have been third party representations received. Third party representations are impact on the character and appearance of the area, impact on residential amenity, construction impacts, highway safety, poor living accommodation, car parking, loss of head row, setting a precedent and issue with brand relocation. Slide 12, as you can see the planning, planning balance, um, it's considered that this application is recommended for approval as there'd be no harm to character the area because of the adjacent permission. 
Um, no unduly impact on residential amenity and the local highways concerns or any other consultees. This balances out the impact on the neighbouring properties and the comments raised in relation to car parking the, in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, so, uh, Maureen, you're the first speaker. I don't know if there are other speakers or just you, but there are three minutes to speak. So if anyone else wants to speak, they can sort of join in after you and we'll add it on to the three minutes. So um, half a minute before the end, the bell goes, we'll let you know you're coming to the end of your three minutes so you know how to time it. Right, thank you. So, sorry. so right-hand button on the front, you press the right-hand one, it lights up, that's it, you're on. This all is for a bungalow at the end of a privately owned, unmade, unlit, 100-metre track at 3.7 metres, only wide enough for one car. If the turning circle outside 346 is built on, it will mean that all vehicles, including emergency vehicles, would have to back out onto Kendall Way, which at the exit point is one way, due to the chicane opposite the track. The land registry proves the track does not belong to 346, but the architect has drawn two parking spaces, a covered cycle rack and a table of chairs there. 246 only has right of way in that area. There is not enough space either to squeeze in two cars and a covered cycleway parking and to reverse out of the space. The track is the only entrance exit to 16 council-run allotments. There are no sheds, so allotmenteers bring their tools each time, usually by car. They park in the turning circle. If that is removed, they will block residents trying to access their back gardens and garages. The land registry shows that the boundary between 344 and 346 is a straight, li straight line. The architect plans show a kink which appears that the applicant is actually taking land from 344. The architects state that there are no trees or hedges adjacent to the development. In fact, there's a line of mature trees and hedging at the boundary with 344. It will be impossible to render a property there or to clean the gutters, etc. The bungalow will be dark because of the trees. The windows facing northeast will be overshadowed as at over only one metre from the bungalow at 348. The door at 346 will be opposite one at 348, which opens outwards. Neither household will have privacy. With no outside door in the kitchen, all fumes will stay indoors. The bin at the rear is a long way from the kitchen. It's shown there to adhere to the regulations of dragging the bin to the roadside for collection. When the bungalow at 348 was built, all lorries had to back down the track. A very difficult manoeuvre with the chicane opposite the entrance. It caused queues along Kendall Way and was dangerous to cyclists and drivers alike. The lorries blocked entrance exits from the rear of the houses facing Milton Road. The track was muddy with large potholes. This bungalow has been empty for two years. Will 346 also be empty to you long term? The layout between 346 and 364 Milton Road is a mirror image. Applications to build houses and bungalows in four of the rear gardens have permission refused or have withdrawn planning permission because they would appear incongruous in the back land location resulting in harm to the character and appearance of the south surrounding area but your with problems no, please, with access. Finish your sentence, if you like. But oh, that's three. it. That's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I okay, so um, that's the only speaker. So thank you very much for that, Maureen. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Councillor Collis, were you going to speak on this item? Yeah, I apologise. I forgot. So Councillor Collis is a ward councillor. Uh, you have unlimited time to speak. Um, so Councillor Collis is also a member of the planning committee, so she won't be debating or voting on this item, but will speak as a ward councillor instead. Thanks, Chair. Can you repeat that? Because I didn't hear any of that. So just saying that um, uh, I forgot that you were speaking, and uh, Councillor Collis is a ward councillor for this ward, King's Hedges, and although you're a member of planning committee, you have decided that you want to speak on this item. Uh, and so that means that you won't be uh, debating the item or voting on the item as we as we other councillors on committee do. Thank 
Thank you, Chair. OK, to speak now? Yeah. OK. Um, thank you very much. So this um, proposed application, I don't feel, and I think residents don't feel, provides what we've committed to in the local plan, which is good quality housing that fits with local neighbourhoods. This doesn't feel like sustainable development. It runs the risk of overdeveloping uh, over what is a small and highly constrained space. Just because technically we could build here, it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do and that the proposal should go ahead. Um, if you look at page 66, point 10.23, that states that there would not be any undue harm to the amenity or living conditions of the adjacent neighbour. And further, point 10.24 states that all other neighbours are far enough removed from the proposal that it would not cause harm to their amenity or living conditions. Um, I would, as ward councillor, as nearby residents have done, question this. I think they raised some very valid concerns about the impact of the proposed development on the area um, and also raised some serious safety concerns. Um, concerns around the impact of construction traffic um, highlighted in relation to previous um, development in the area have already been outlined and I don't think we want to see that repeated. At 3.7 metres, the track is barely wide enough for one car and squeezing in two cars seems ambitious at most. And I don't think committee can ignore the potential consequences of this. We also cannot... I don't think, have emergency vehicles being forced to back down a track. I wouldn't want to see um, blocking other residents trying to access their back gardens. I just don't feel that there is simply, there's simply not sufficient room either for existing or new residents of any proposed property to access the, safe, uh, the space safely or with any real degree of enjoyment. Accepting this um, proposed development could set a seriously regressive precedent. Um, there are concerns about deliveries reaching, um, reaching the proposed property, tradesmen. Um, how will it be found when it's not on a road? You know, and what would happen if all the houses facing Milton Road decided to build a house or a bungalow in their garden? You know, it would be too many people living in too close proximity and like I've already said, it runs the risk of overdeveloping what is a small and constrained space. And I just want to finish by repeating, just because we could technically build there, it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so over to uh, Planning Committee Councillors. Councillor Walthrop Wood. Um, right, so I've got concerns about access, uh, deliveries, emergency vehicles... Can you speak a bit closer to your microphone, please, right. Councillor? Uh, access down this unmade road. First of all, who owns it? Secondly, um, you know, ensuring that there is a right of way. Thirdly, there's the issue about the length of it and getting bins onto the highway to Kendall Road. Uh, access to emergency vehicles and fire, uh, fire engines. Um, I'm also very concerned about this boundary at the front um, where there are cycles and cycle spaces. Now, it also seems to me there aren't enough cycle spaces um, for the number of bedrooms in this, uh, in this propose proposal. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, there is a bungalow that oddly got planning permission next door, but I understand that that was uh, for the use of the householder at 348 and his disabled son. Um, so I just wondered if the planning officer could comment on those things. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Any more questions for the officer before we... Okay. Oh, yes, uh, councillor Pora. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Yeah, I do share some concerns. I think it's a very large house. It's welcome that it's above space standards. That's good. But the garden is comparatively small, so I'd be grateful if the officer could just comment, because I don't think we formally assessed it in the officer's report about in terms of subdivision of an existing plot. Um, I am concerned that to paragraph 10.23 suggests that the pathway to the back is only one metre, which I understand it should be at least 1.2. I know we're not taking cycles down there, but we're still going to get people down there and potentially wheelchairs or anything else. So I wonder if someone could comment on whether one metre for a pathway to the back garden, where I think it's the only access to the garden, is acceptable. Um, I think on the slide that the planning officer showed, it seemed that there were windows on the new-built bungalow next door that seemed to look directly into where we're proposing to build with this application. But I may have misread that, so I'd be grateful if um, Jane could just confirm that. I am concerned. I note that I think one of the speakers suggested that they don't own the turning circle and that the parking spaces are not on the land owned by the applicant. So I'd be grateful if we could be confirmed that we're satisfied that we've got a certificate of ownership because obviously if that is currently used as a turning circle and it isn't owned by them, they could, shouldn't be putting parking spaces and bikes on there. Um, and again, it, it's just generally, I suppose, the cumulative effect of more cars. I know it's small because it's only one or two parking spaces, but particularly where they are with the turning circle and with the access to the allotments, I'd be interested in the officer's views as to how detrimental that would be. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Jane, perhaps you could just confirm if it's a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom application. Looking at the plans, it appears to have three rooms that could be bedrooms, although one is called a home office. Um, and um, also, just comment also in terms of the amenity space that's available to it. Um, it's all for me for the minute. I have something else I'll bring up in a minute, I think. Oh, sorry, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to comment that usually a bungalow is highly suitable for uh, residents with disabilities, particularly physical disabilities. However, in this case, um, I, it's, you'd usually require at least 1.1 metre to get a wheelchair um, down a path safely without damaging the wheelchair of a person. Uh, that would be for a normal wheelchair. Some power chairs and mobility scooters require a, a larger gap. Um, I'm concerned that the main access is by an access road, which is poorly lit. Um, that's particularly problematic for particular disabilities. Um, such as my own um, and also um, I am concerned about where the doors are and the access to the garden uh, I think it's actually going to be very difficult um, for say a wheelchair occupant to actually move around on site thank you thank you councillor Okay, Jane, do you want to respond to those points or questions, um, please, if you can, when you're ready? Thank you, Chair. In, sorry, I may do these in a different order than they were given. In regards of who has access to the other building, there was no condition put on it of who was to use the bungalow next door. There was no ownership or occupation condition on the property. In regards of how many bedrooms, we've assessed it as if it's a two-bedroom house, four-bedroom, per four-person house. Jane, can you speak up a bit, please, or speak a bit closer to your microphone? Is that better? Thank you. Well. Um, so we've assessed this application as if it's a two-bedroom, four-person property. And on... Paragraph 10.28 is a table showing there. Um, the policy requirement is 70 metres squared, and this is 110 metres squared, so it's an extra 40 metres squared internally for two bedrooms, four people. Regards of ownership, 
Um, originally, when the application came in, a certificate D wasn't signed. This was later submitted to show that they don't have ownership of the access, and this was considered as, through the application, that was cons um, consulted on for 21 days as well. Um, in regards of parking and access to the site, if I can share my screen again. You can see from this plan here, oh goodness, bear with me a second. This plan here, parking spaces are located outside of the access track here. You can see from this site location plan, within the site. As I said before, certificate D was signed and submitted with this application. Regarding the amount of cycle spaces, so they're shown as two cycle spaces to the front of the site. And Please bear with me. There is a condition 13. Sorry, the condition 13 is to do with um, green roof of the bin and bike stores. Um, with the access track into the back garden, so as you can see, it's running along the top there between the two bungalows. I believe that is uh, one metre into the back garden. There is internal access into the back garden. This plan appears to have moved. I need to find that one again, Chair, sorry, for that plan. And uh, windows between the properties. So this is the picture. There you go, showing the, the right-hand one is the bungalow that's already there. As you can see, there's a boundary fence. There'll be a boundary fence and the one metre path and then the proposed bungalow on its right hand side, is that? Sorry Chair, Can I, what, what is, is that a door that's set behind the fence then? It's really hard to see. I was just trying, but it's obscured already by the fence in effect. Yes, then. Yep, so on the previous plans, it's a door, door and a window I believe. If I can zoom in a bit more. Door and a high level, sorry, it's really delayed. <laughs> Door in a high level window. So you asked a follow up question there, Councillor Pora. Was that clear? Did you get the answer you wanted? Yeah. I, I think I was just, if we were to agree to build where it's proposed, is, is that going to have any overlooking or overshadowing impacts? I'm guessing it looks like an obscured window, but I just would be grateful for that. I'd also be grateful if the officer might just go back. My understanding is that there's only a path of one metre and there's no other access to the garden because at the moment the bins are in the back garden. I'm assuming they're going to have to be dragged down a one metre wide path, which I don't think is wide enough because I don't think there was a door. I think there's another property next door, if I'm right. All right, thanks for that, Councillor. Um, uh, Jane, did you finish answers to the previous questions? OK, you're obviously working on those things. Um, I'm going to go back to questions from councillors then, Jane, if you're able to keep going with that. So, um, Councillor Bennett. I'd like to thank Jane for confirming that it's quite clear that there would be considerable access problems um, if you, uh, somebody 
if one of the occupants is wheelchair, which doesn't seem unlikely for a bungalow, um, you have to get them out of the door into the garden, down this one metre track, and then load uh, the wheelchair and the occupier into a car. Um, one metre, you could possibly do that with a manual wheelchair if you have, say, a child or a teenage occupant. Um, I could not do it myself. Um, and you certainly couldn't get a mobility scooter down there. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we'll perhaps have that confirmed by officers in terms of what the policy says. So, Councillor Gawthrop would. Well, I think I'm reiterating. I'm probably reiterating what I asked before, but I want to be absolutely clear on the boundary, where the boundary of 346 currently is, and whether there is any encroachment onto the unadopted track. I think it's unadopted. And who owns that? Um, and I'm also concerned, you know, can a bin lorry get up this, this track? And how far is it to the main to Kendall Way? Thanks. Okay, we'll we'll get confirmation for, for that from officers. So um, just in terms of those things, uh, um, I mean, I know it's might be a matter of concern, but um, things like the track are civil matters that would have to be taken up outside of this meeting, and we wouldn't be able to re use that as a reason. And things like the uh, access for bins, there will be something that the officers will say with regard to that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to officers to respond. And things like fire, which I think was mentioned as well. I mean, we've had that before in items where uh, firefighters can travel a certain distance from their vehicle to the property with their hoses if necessary. So that's another thing that officers can perhaps confirm in terms of this application. Councillor Thornborough. Can the officer us answer the question about the adjacent building? Is that a is that a dwelling which has to be used in in conjunction with the main house, or is it a separate dwelling? I think that's important. Okay. Yep. Good point. I think so. Um, uh, Jane looks like she's still looking up things at the moment. So am I good to go to you? Can I ask you now? Yep, so if yep. you respond to those questions then, please, Jane. Yep, I can answer some of them if that's okay. Um, thank you, Chair. So in regards of the neighbour bungalow, I've had a look at the previous application and there was no condition restricting the use of the bungalow um, for the previous use. So there had to be part of... Um, number 348, there was no, and the description of development of that bungalow, there's a erection of single-storey dwelling to the rear of 348 as well. There's no condition restricting its use. In regards of the boundary line, the red line plan that was submitted let me get back up again. This is what was submitted as part of the application. I believe is it this side here? That's a concern. When the applicant was, when the application was submitted, a certificate D wasn't signed, which is the assumption for this part here. But otherwise, it was signed that the applicant owns everything within the red line of their site. One. They don't own this part here, hence certificate D being signed. But then everything else that's submitted is in the red line. Um, with regard to bins, I may need to get back to you on that one in a second, just finding that one out. Was that everything so far? 
Councillors, you missed anything out? Councillor Cawthorne, what did I say? Missed or is this a new thing? Yes, okay, go ahead then. So I'm still not clear what is the, whether, can I be absolutely clear that in front of the proposed property, where the block paving Speak into is, the microphone, please, right. Councillor. Where There's the no block paving hear. is, where the car parking spaces are and where proposed and the proposed, you know, it's the brown and the grey. What comes within, what is it part of the existing property and what is part of the access, the, the unadopted road? I want to be absolutely clear that this hasn't been encroached on. And then there's the other thing which which is, you know, how do people get into the allotments? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. You okay on that? Yeah, go ahead then, Jane. Are you with... Yeah. So with this um, application, the grey and the brown above it, on the right-hand side, would be the existing trackway there and then everything on the left would be the proposed parking spaces and the block paving as you can see my mouse moving up on the that brown bit there the plan above it above, above shows this concrete area at the moment so the car parking would end in line here the double garage here so there would be space for the current residents to park outside on this gravel already. The garage and lawn. Okay, thanks, Jane. Uh, Councillor, you want to come back on that? Um, yeah, I'm still not clear how they're going to revert, whether or not, you know, a car or a van is going to be able to reverse around, you know, it's the turning circle. And then there's the red line, the access. I mean, it's not, not terribly clear to me if there's any access through the garden onto Milton Road, you know, with the passageway. You know, that, that's not clear to me. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, I mean, my understanding is that what's happening here is that the existing bungalow has been built a bit back from the, from the track so that you can get access onto that land to park, I suppose, or, or get onto it if you want to do something on it. And the same thing has happened here, that the new the application is, is leaving some space to drive onto. So the, the I don't know if people are misunderstanding that maybe the the back of the existing bungalow is the is proposed to be the edge of the public of, of their land and then the pub, pub, you know the track starts after that, but that's not the case as far as I'm reading it. But Jane, can you Confirm, am I saying the right thing or the wrong thing? That's the way I read it. As far as I'm assuming, that's what I could confirm as well, that their land would stop as the grey, as the brown becomes grey. So they would be parking on their own land, as they can do at the moment. So it's like the case with back gardens generally, you have garages. Sometimes people build their garage right up to the track, so you can turn into it very easily. Some people set their garage back a bit, waste a bit of their land sort of thing, but so you can get a nice easy turning circle in. So in this case, it's not a garage, it's a bungalow, but the bungalow has been set back. So there's space to turn into that space to be able to park there if you wanted to. Um, the other question, Jane, which Councillor Gawthorpe would put to you was access through the site to Milton Road. Um, do you want to comment on that at all? Thank you. No direct access through the front. Um, it's my assumption that this would be, I'll keep on trying to zoom in a bit further, um, this would become a boundary between the two, it's not, there's a screenshot, so it's not clear that it's there, so everything access for buys would be through the track, um, and going back on a question as well, so there is no access through the front of this bungalow, all the access into the property would be about halfway down. So there's... Uh, 
a second, sorry. Jane, can I, can I just come yeah. in? Um, I'm a little bit confused about the access from the front because from the plans pack, um, it looks as if there's a separate 1.2 metre wide access down, down the side of number 346 to the rear garden of the proposed bungalow. Share my screen, Chair, if that would help. Yeah, do that, yeah. Unfortunately, the, unfortunately, the res resolution's not, not, not great, but it looks as if there's, this says new, I think this says new, new gate here with an access down the side of 346 of 1.2 metres into that rear garden area. Is that clear to members? Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I'm not quite clear which access, which property it's for, but um, I know there are councillors with hands up. Yes, I know. Uh, there are three of you, but I'm just trying to bottom this out first. Jane, are you able to give clarity here, or do you need to, I guess, go on with more questions? Or Toby? So from that plan there, I do apologise, that's one I was trying just to find. It would be, there'll be access from the front of 346 to the properties. It wouldn't be a complete boundary across the back of it. And there's also, as you said before, the the footpath to the north of that and then this along the track going across the top okay I, I think we'll perhaps leave it there it might just be to do with the um drawings possibly inaccuracy it does happen um it's not quite clear who that access is for whether it's for the proposed dwelling or for the existing dwelling or both um but there does seem to be some sort of access shown there um, I think we'll move on with more questions. So, um, Councillor Poor, you're for... Sorry, mine was literally about that. Before Toby intervened, I was about to say, for me, this would be a straight refusal because there's only a one-metre passageway and there is no access to the rear garden from the back of the house. If you look, the front door and the side door are halfway down. Well, one's at the front and one's in the one-metre passageway. I'm also concerned from the Google map and from Jane's other plans... There's a house next door, so that passageway to the gate doesn't go anywhere. It'd have to be through someone else's land to get out. So my view at the moment is, and I not, would not be happy voting for this without proper clarification, which I hate to say deferral, but at the moment, I'm not satisfied that the 1.2 metre path leads anywhere, because I think there's a property next door and they obviously don't own that. So my, my concern was going to be, without that, how do you get the bins, never mind anyone with a wheelchair? There is, there is no accessible access to the rear at the moment if it's a one-metre gap. You know, and I think, generally, I think the property's quite large for the site. I don't, you know, ideally it would be a little bit thinner and then you could fit that through and that would resolve my concerns. But obviously we can only look at what we've got on the table. But I think number 344, four, I'm guessing, must be, that's their garden that that path leads into. So that's not hypothesised, councillor, because we don't really know. The yeah, but I mean, I suppose at the moment I'm not confident that there is a 1.2 metre access to the rear garden. And I know that there's no, the bedrooms are at the back, so they've just got windows. So there's no access through the house to the rear without going along the one metre passageway. Thanks. Thank you, councillor. Toby wants to say something. It, it looks to me as if the access goes through 346 and 346 has a blue line around it, which indicates it's land within the upper can control so the the access from the from the front is within the blue blue line and a new access of there a new gate is being installed here 
which leads into the rear, the rear, the rear garden area, and that looks to be 1.2 metres wide. Clearly, you know, if we were, if members were to approve these um, plans, and it turned out that the scheme was undeliverable because of land ownership issues, then they wouldn't have a scheme that would be capable of implementation, but we have to take what they've submitted at face value in terms of their control over the land, both within the red line and the blue line. Thanks. Thanks, Toby. Uh, Councillor Thornborough. We, we keep being told that we have to just accept what's on the drawing, and that, as uh, we were told, you know, the red line between 346 and this proposal goes straight down. If you, if they had a right of way over the blue line boundary, that should be clearly marked on a planning drawing, which becomes a very important document in the future. But it's, it should be a hatched red space if there is access to Milton Road, and that's not shown. And it's, I don't know why this, sh we should have asked that this access road was taken out of the red line boundary and just shown as red hatched. But if you take, if we take this as a drawing, as it is, in, I don't, it is completely unclear about access along the side of 346. And if there is access, I want, would like to know what might obstruct that in the future. Are there doors? Are there bins there? Are there windows that these people are expected to go back and forwards? Is there something in the front garden that would obstruct this access? So I, I'm going to assume that there is no access through 346 because it's not shown with a red hatch. And I think the one metre uh, between this proposal and the bungalow is completely inadequate for um, accessing, for, for providing uh, a good quality space, space to use this property in a way that would enhance, you know, the people, you know, their lives of the people living there. It's, um, I think, I think it'd be difficult. I think the, the, the idea of a dwelling has probably, at the back, has probably been established by the adjacent building, but this, the access ability of a site is fundamental, and I don't think this is, um, has met the requirement for an accessible site. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I think some of what you've said are assumptions, and they do contradict what officers have just said, i.e. Toby. So um, I'm going to allow Toby to come back on that, and perhaps if you and maybe other councillors feel that is the case in terms of what you've just said, then we're going to have to defer this item, because I don't want you to vote on this item in terms of information that's flawed, uh, or, or thinking that's flawed, rather, because I think there is a lacking of evidence here. But uh, Toby, you speak. Thanks, Chair. I think some of the points that Councillor Thornborough um, are making is are there valid ones I think officers have come to a different assumption to councillors I, I think in the interests of fairness we we should perhaps consider the deferral of this item my view is that councillor Thornborough you're probably right if there is access from Milton Road that should have been included within the within the red line specifically and be secured through through the permission it's probably also relevant that we understand in that scenario actually what is happening on the side of 346 specifically in order to demonstrate that there's, for example, no loss of privacy or, 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 or obstruction. So there's the sensible course of action given the ambiguity and would perhaps move to defer this item and bring it back once those matters are cleared up. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. I mean, that's up, for, up to us councillors to decide. So um, we've not had a we've not completed our debate on this item yet, and perhaps we better just have a vote now as to whether we do want to defer this item for more information, as has been said. Councillor Poro, I would support defer. I would also like to just add, Toby, could we check the width of the passage between three, four, six? It looks to narrow from one point two to one. I think. So I think the more information, the better. I do still have concerns, as Councillor Thorne said, about how close it is to the next door property, just to put that out there. It's not a reason for deferral, but I think that's something the applicant might want to consider. So I would support deferral. Happy okay, to so I proposed that. deferral, you supported it, you seconded it rather, 
Um, we don't need to have for a debate on this item if we're going to do that. And yes, there's anything else with regard to deferral that councillors wanted to speak about? No. Okay. So, all those in favour of deferral? It's all councillors. Okay, that's vote unanimous. Then, so the item is deferred to a future meeting of this committee. Okay. So thanks for that, councillors. Um, we'll break for lunch now and um, come back at quarter to two, please. Well, actually, it could be 20 to 2, couldn't it, I suppose? Yeah, say 20 to 2. Um, we don't want to. And um, thank you, Councillor Bishop, for staying to the end of the item, because I know you needed to get away at 1 o'clock. So thank you. OK, thank you, Councillors. Thank you, officers.
Okay, welcome back everyone to planning afternoon session. We've had a nice lunch now, so we're raring to go. And the next item, well, first off, we um, we left out item six, Cherry Hinton Road, as there are no public speakers on that one and we're behind time. So we're just going to move on through the agenda now as it's set out. So item seven, eight, nine, ten, and then assuming we have time, we'll do that item at the end of that. So after item ten. So the next item on the agenda is Clare, item eight, Clare College Sports Ground. And that's Tom Gray. And there's one speaker, Alex Tunbridge, on that one. So that's the applicant. So Tom, if you're ready to present the item then, please. Hello, Tom, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, I can hear I you okay. Screen. Yeah, I can hear you, so when you're ready. Yeah, so the application is for a demolition of the existing buildings and replacement with a new training facility at Clare College. Um, the applicant is, as you say, Chair, uh, Cambridge United Football Club. The um, proposal um, will be located um, adjacent to uh, existing football fields. Um, on Clare College owned land. The applica application is located in the Cambridge uh, Greenbelt and it is a protected open space. Um, it is also adjacent to a city wildlife site which borders the application boundary to the west. That is uh, Vickers Brook and Hobson's Conduit and uh, Bentley Road Paddocks um, uh, city wildlife site. Um, the application uh, site boundary is surrounded by mature trees. It's adjacent to flood zone two, three, and the yeah, public right of way uh, runs along the western boundary. The existing facility comprises um, temporary facilities, um, sheds and um, porter cabins. As you can see from the site photos, so the one on the left, is the Google um, image, 3D image, showing the uh, the current setup of the site. Uh, these are porter cabins used for the training facilities and some sheds and other storage facilities. The two pictures on the right uh, were taken last year. Um, these consist of, um, as I say, the temporary uh, porter cabins currently used for the training facilities. The proposal is to erect a new purpose-built single-storey building, um, which would um, comprise a green roof and solar PVs um, and be uh, situated to the west of the current pavilion building. There will also be an extension to the existing ground shed, groundsman workshop. Here's existing ground floor plans. and then the proposed plans. So showing additional facilities, gym, um, as well as meeting rooms and change facilities. Here's the existing uh, roof plan at the top here and the proposed roof plan at the bottom. Here are the existing elevations of the site. So show, showing the top one is the existing east elevations. So that's the, the, the area visible from internally within the site. The western elevation is the one along the, that you can see from uh, the, the polar right away. And then you've got the northern and the southern elevations. Here are the proposed elevations. So showing the single story building, the materials would be used, would be timber cladding um, uh, that would successfully allow it to assimilate into the rural context. Here's the existing and proposed site sections. And the same on the western side. The 
The proposal allows for um, a biodiversity net gain to be achieved on the site. Um, some soft landscaping, uh, additional la landscaping would be um, proposed uh, to the west of the, the building and also some more wild, um, wildflower meadow planting and shrub planting to the eastern side of the boundary. The applicants supplied some visualisations of what the building would look like. This is the, the top one is the view from the, the public right of way that runs along uh, Hobson's Conduit. Um, as you can see, the top of the roof is just about visible over the, the, um, the fence line, um, just projecting above it. Uh, this is would be, as I say, timber cladded uh, building. And then the <coughs> bottom um, visualization is from the guided busway um, and you can see just about making out beyond the, the Hawthorne hedge there um, in the distance. So the application is recommended for approval um, subject to conditions as stated within the um, the, uh, the original officer report and the amendment sheet I've stated. Um, I would suggest that members look at the amendment sheet for um, amendments to the wording of some of the conditions. Have you finished, Tom? Yes, thank you. OK, so, so councillors, there's two... Yeah, I know, yeah, two pages of... Um, Amendments on the sheets. I'm sure you've all got that, have you, on paper or on your screens? Okay, good. Okay, so Alex, you want to speak now? So, well, I'll take your place at the public speaker thing at the back there. If you press your the right hand button on on the thing, and um, it will light up hopefully, and then you get three minutes to talk, and about half a minute before the end, um, that will go to let you know you're coming to the end of your time, so you know how to time it. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, dear members of the committee. My name is Alex Tunbridge. I'm here as the Chief Executive Officer of the Football Club. The average person spends 2,040 hours a year in their place of work, or at least they certainly did before COVID. But for professional footballers and a club's backroom staff, training at home in a back garden and providing physio treatment on kitchen tables is simply not practical. Like every employer, Cambridge United has the desire to ensure its players and staff have a working environment which they enjoy and that harnesses professional development. At present, the reality is that we fail in providing that. I can confidently say, based upon my own professional experiences in the game, that our training facilities are the worst not in only our division, English Football League One, the third tier of English football, but in the league below as well. Consequently, we are failing to attract and retain players that are a calibre for this league, which allow us to sustain performance levels in League One. Many praise our culture and community values, but arguably, we are failing. Fair College Sports Ground has been our training base for many years, and we have agreed a new long-term lease to investing in the site. The pitches are fantastic, but the support of the facilities are not suitable for a professional football club. Our application includes professional changing rooms, modern medical facilities, as well as a collaborative environment, which will house our first team and under 18s in one place, and allow us to develop young local players. Through provision of enhanced high quality cycle facilities, we shall, wherever possible, encourage our staff and players to travel to the site by sustainable means. A travel plan will be provided to facilitate this. Further, the building proposed is of the highest standards from a sustainability perspective, achieving a net gain in biodiversity through the provision of a green roof, BREAM excellent, and minimised water usage. This is consistent with local policy and represents a vast improvement upon existing facilities. The improvement in facilities does not mean there will be an increase in the usage level to the site. To the contrary, by adding the facilities proposed in this application, we will see a reduction in traffic with food and laundry no longer requiring transportation, as well as removing the need for fortnightly sewage tankers as we are proposing to connect the foul drains to the mains. Whilst in the Green Belt, sports and training facilities are defined as an acceptable use within the Green Belt, where they would not have material impacts upon the openness. Indeed, there are many such facilities within Cambridge, and from the officer's presentation, you can see this high-quality building of single storey will represent a significant improvement in terms of its appearance or having very limited impact upon views, visibility and openness. 
Further, the application has been found to have no technical reasons why as not to approve the development with no objections from internal departments or statutory consultees. I, players, supporters and employees are all custodians of the club and hold a collective responsibility to ensure it operates in a sustainable manner whilst being embedded into the community. Competing at the highest level of the game is our goal and therefore this application forms an integral part of the club's development, in turn benefiting future generations of the city's residents. Accordingly, I request that you follow the officer's recommendation and support the application. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Okay, I'm going to turn your microphone off, Marion, please. Thanks. So, um, that's all the speakers. So, over to councillors for debate. Councillor Gawthrop Wood. <coughs> um, I'm just having a bit of trouble reading what's on the proposed ground floor plan. Um, and I wondered if you could just sort of walk through what some of the rooms are. And I also wondered, disabled access, do you have, I, presumably, uh, is this open for use by some disabled footballers? And is it accessible? And I'm thinking of the changing rooms and the loos. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions before I go back to Tom? Councillor Porro. Uh, I don't have a lot of concerns. I just wanted to check under the tree section 8.37, is the officer satisfied that because we can't avoid the root protection areas that we can manage that during construction and afterwards to make sure those tree roots are still protected? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. I just had a question. Considering that CUFC is in my ward and that we work closely with CUFC Community Trust, uh, is it appropriate for me to participate in this debate and vote on this proposal? Yeah, well, the decision to uh, participate or not is your own decision, Councillor. I mean, I won't comment except to say that it's your decision, but you can, um, the uh, legal uh, advisor might want to comment. Keith? Uh, Chair, thank you. I, I wouldn't add anything to what the Chair has said. If you are um, comfortable that you are not prejudiced, then that's for you to decide upon. If you prefer to sit this one out, that's your decision. I do not feel that my discretion is fettered. However, I'm just concerned about the look of it to outsiders. So if it's any use to you, Councillor, I mean, in the past, I've seen some councillors not vote on items that are in their ward full stop, which I always felt was wrong because they're on transmitted to do a job. We're all here to do a non-political, uh, non-ward-based job of sitting on planning committee. As a quasi-judicial committee, we make decisions to you know, help the city go forward. So that's, that's our job. And, I mean, if you feel you're unfettered, then there's no reason why you can't continue to um, debate the item. But, but it really is your decision in the end, so I, that's all I can say. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'll just say, um, if you could say any more about the timber cladding, Tom, and are there any uh, adverse effects from any changes in light levels to the um, sort of natural boundary? Um, that's all, I think. I mean, it seems like a very good application and, and doing good stuff, you know. It's more sports facilities, we need that. And what's not to like, really, as far as I can see. But obviously, we need to give it a bit of scrutiny. So, carry on. Councillor Bajant. Chair, I, I think it's very important to make the point that this is on Greenbelt and that we're not lightly looking at this. That it is something that, to my mind, is an obvious improvement. It's for the good of the community. And... and probably good for Cambridge per se because it's our football team. But that's not a subjective view. The, the reality is this is on green built, built, built land. And we're just going to approve this. And I think it's totally right that we probably should. Well, I'm assuming that we're going to approve it. Not that yet, Councillor, do we? That's, that's, that's <laughs> one thing after another. Um, any more questions? Councillor Gawthrop Wood. It's a comment, not a question. But, I mean, certainly we're not taking lightly the fact that it's on Greenbelt. Um, but this does replace, you know, a set of very temporary, rather tatty-looking buildings with something... Sorry, that that's... <laughs> that, yeah. Sorry, that's my opinion, with something that, all right, it's more permanent, but looks quite good. I think it's a fair point. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, back to Tom then. 
Thank you. Any answers, Tom, or comments on what has been said? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors. Um, yeah, first thing is I'll share my screen uh, for the ground floor plan. So the main entrance is over here. Um, so you have office office accommodation, analysis room. You've got a meeting room over here and then some circulation space, some dining areas, kitchen facility, uh, laundry and boot rooms, a gym. And then at the back of the facility, you have the changing facilities and toilets. Um, in terms of accessibility, um, I do know there's some double doors coming into the site <clears throat> and in terms of the circulation spaces. For the change rooms themselves, I, I'm sorry, I'm not measured in terms of the door width, um, but um, perhaps we, in terms of building control, um, in terms of those, that's next stage. To obviously, look at the accessibility in terms of this, um, but perhaps we can put an informative or, or, or like on the on the, any consent granted to encourage um, accessibility, internal accessibility there. Uh, the tree, uh, the tree impacts. Um, the tree officer did have concerns about the root of the um, of the drainage, uh, surface water drainage. Um, as I said in my report, um, this is the only only um, way of, of achieving the drainage on the site, um, and they have submitted a, an agriculture impact assessment as part of the scheme, which um, does uh, demonstrate how they can avoid as much as possible the root protection areas. And where they do affect the root protection areas, that there'll be any any um, impact to be minimised um, in the way that they construct uh, and dig uh, for the for the pipe work. Um, the light levels um, have uh, have been considered. Uh, have talked to the um, nature conservation officer about this. Um, given that they are it is a single storey building and minimal glazing on that rear elevation facing the uh, city wildlife site, um, we are content that light levels will be minimised below the 0.5 lux levels uh, as recommended. Um, and that is conditioned as part of any consent granted. Um, the timber cladding, um, I'll just share my screen. Um, that's the wrong one. So there is three types of timber cladding being proposed on the on the application. This is um, these details are to be conditioned, and we, we're going to re require material um, sample materials of of these um, materials. So, um, but this is um, this is a sort of timber cladding that would be built um, subject to condition. Thank you. Sorry, I think that's I was all just, the questions. I you think. know, I was just looking at the um, the thing on the screen. I was reading the stuff about the, the cladding because yeah. I always like to see that sort of detail. I'm a bit obsessive about that sort of thing. So yes, that all looks very good to me. Um, any more questions, councillors? No. Okay. Well, let's have the uh, recommendation then, please. So, being well, we'll go to the vote. Thanks, chair. So the uh, recommendation is set out on page ninety nine of the officer report. That is to approve the planning application subject to the conditions as set out below with minor amendments to the conditions as drafted, delegated to officers and those amended conditions as set out on the amending sheet. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. So the recommendation is pulled on. Just waiting while one of the officers speaks. That's all good. Okay. The recommendation is one of approval. All those in favour of that recommendation? Seven, Chair. Okay, that's passed. Then. Thank you very much. The item is approved. Um, now, we have a bit of an issue now because I think I talked to next people, quarter to three for the next item. Yeah, that's item six, Chair. We, yeah, that might, might be the best thing if we go back to item six and fill in with that one, I think. Officers, do you. 
What do you think? Is that okay? I'm trying to juggle, juggle items here, people. Get it all done. Um, but I think that might be the best thing to do. Uh, Councillor Thornborough. I have to leave in half an hour. So um, I'll stay. But if I have to leave, I might, I might miss out on the vote, depending on how long it takes. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Yeah, so let's go back to item... Is she very far away? She's up, upstairs. Okay, so let's have a couple of minutes break then, because the officer is going to present the item in person at the moment. She's in the building but upstairs. She needs to come down and get it ready. So if we, if we start the next item in sort of like a few minutes at quarter past, um, so then we'll get going on that. Thank you.
chair. So this application. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. So, I'm sorry. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Had a short break there. Uh, we're ready to go now with the next item, planning committee today. So we're going to go back to item six, six, which we missed out earlier, Cherry Hinton Road. The presenting officer is Jay, um, Jane Roden. Uh, Jane, uh, speakers, no speakers, yeah. So if you just get your own then, please, Jane. So thank you, Chair. This application before members seeks planning permission to erect a second floor extension to the buildings of number 208 and 208A Cherry Hinton Road. The second floor extension was result in two dwellings flat units. As the application is between for between one and nine dwellings, there are third party representations that cannot be resolved by planning condition. There are no objections for any other consultees. The main consideration is impact on the character area. Um, neighbouring amenity, amenity of future occupiers, highways, car parking and bin storage. That's the location plan. Um, so the site is located to the southern side of Cherry Hinton Road and is located within Cherry Hinton Road East Local Neighbourhood Centre. Uh, here's the aerial view of the proposal site and the access. Here's a GIS map um, of the extent of the local neighbourhood centre and the safeguarded pub to the west known as the Rock. This is the elevation plans, existing elevations to the front, existing side and rear. The proposed elevations. Proposed ground and first floor plans. The proposed second floor plan. Now this highlights the proposed amenity area, bin storage and cycle parking. And here's the proposed site layout plan with a proposal that's um, been given permission to the south of the site. And here's some photos of the site facing the building from Cherry Hinton Road. As you're looking along Cherry Hinton Road. And then these ones are looking from the rear of the site. The main comments for this application is there have been no objections for highways and sustainable drainage officer. The environmental health has requested um, conditions and there's been one third party representation received. So the third party representation is about bin storage, disabled access, flood issues and intensification use of the site. So on planning balance, um, it's recommended for approval as in part 10 of the delegated report, there'd be no harm to the character of the area, no unduly impact on the residential community. The proposal applies, complies with recap standards. There's no local highways authority concerns or consultees. And this balances out the impact on the bin storage, potential incidentification of the site. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Jane. So, um, Councillor Bate, Councillor Bennett. I'm not sure whether that gentleman over there might be a public speaker. He put his hand up at the commencement of the item. Uh, it's that, that, hello, sir. Yeah, you use the item uh, later on in the, in the meeting, item 10. That's all right. Don't worry. Right, yep. Um, so what we're doing is we miss we did item five today and then we skipped item six because there are no public speakers and item seven had public speakers who were waiting. So we did item seven and then went to item eight, but item eight uh, didn't take very long. So we decided, or I decided, to go back to item six and fill in with that one before we do the next item in the agenda, because we've missed out that one. That's the plan. So, councillors, um, Councillor Bennett, did you want to say something else about the item, or? Yeah. No, thank you, Chair. It seems very clear. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Councillors, any more? Um, looks like no debate. Uh, So perhaps, Jane, you could talk a bit, I don't think you mentioned it so far, that the, the back of the site has planning permission already 
for development, which by the look of all the breeze blocks and out of the back in that picture, looks like it might have already started on site, but um, that might be a consideration perhaps for us to be aware of a bit more. Councillor Gawthrop, would you have some questions? Um, yeah, it's about amenity and use of what I thought in the plans. It talks about a back garden, but it looks as though it's a building site. Um, and the second thing was, what are there going to be enough um, cycle stands, stores, uh, which are at the front, I think. And I'd wondered, I can't remember seeing anything. There is something on the EV, I think on EV, but um, on the heating, um, yeah, heating method and energy use. I mean, it's, oh yes, it does say, you know, where, where there are solar panels, that that's uh, condition 10. But I don't know whether or not there are solar panels proposed. Thanks. Right, you done, Councillor? Councillor, have you oh, finished? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions, Councillors? Uh, Councillor Bajant. Chair, can we have a discussion or some more information from the officer about the the outside amenity for these? Homes. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? No. Oh, yes, Councillor Pora. I think I may be getting slightly confused, but paragraph eight point three nine talks about the existing units being plus thirteen above space standards, and then it goes on to say that. So, are we taking some space for the ones on the first floor to put in the steps to the ones on the second floor? because it reduces it down to zero above space standards. And I know, as ever, that studios with one person is almost certainly going to be a double bedroom, but I appreciate it. We can't do anything about that. But it's quite frustrating, because 37 metres is very small when you're going to basically have a double bed in there and probably two people. But, yeah, could you just clarify what's happening to the existing ones? And as, as the chair says, whether they've actually been built out or not at the moment. It feels a bit convoluted. Um, perhaps you can bring some clarity, Jane, hopefully. Okay, back to you then, Jane. I think I think we're done with questions for the minute. Thank you, Chair. If I can share my screen. These... So, behind the site, there is planning permission in this space here, marked out in red, uh, for this permission of four dwellings. So this is the shop unit at the front, and then these are the dwellings. This is the buildings, builder site that you could see before, and they would have the same access going off down the bottom. Uh, I've tried to put some more plans together to make it clearer. So this is the floor plans of the ones that have been permitted. And these are the elevations. So this is... The main road up here, 208, I've marked it on the map there. And then this is the units coming downwards. And then where I've marked access, that's the access track at the back. So in the same orientation, this is the back of number 208. With the coloured markings is the amenity areas. So in regards to the amenity question, paragraphs uh, 843 onwards it talks about the amenity space out the back so there'll be a total of 73 meters meters squared for both these two new flats and the two flats that currently exist in paragraph uh, 844 so that's the pink area that you can see on the left hand side of the top map I can zoom in if needed. It's the community here outside. Cycle parking. At the moment, there is no cycle parking for any of the flats. So this proposal includes six 
parking, cycle parking spaces, just on the right hand side there. Regards of energy use, we have implied uh, recommended conditions. Seven seconds. Condition 11, um, but there is no solar panels proposed at the moment on this site, so it'd be through the condition that we'd find out those sorts of details. Um, and then internal space standards. So yes, those flats already exist on the first floor. Proposed to be reduced to include this stairwell in the middle, which is the table just before paragraph 841. And then the flats above would use those stairs. Hey, Chair. Thank you. So um, Jane is bravely taking over an item here that somebody, another officer's item. So she's doing well so far, but there's a lot of detail here. So um, follow up questions or questions haven't been answered. I'll go first. So I'm not quite clear, Jane, on 8.43 and 8.44. You said that the uh, item would provide 73 metres squared. So I'm not clear if that's the amenity space that will be available to this application after the potential building out of the other application at the back of the site or not, and whether that's a planning matter. And then also um, 8.43, there's, a, there's a, an amount of space that is measured at 1.5 metres times 2.7 metres, a total area of 4.2 metres. I'm not quite clear about that. Is that meant to refer to the balconies? It is, it doesn't say that's all. Okay, so that's the balcony space. Right, I've got you. So is that space included in the 73 metres? I presume not, so that's extra to that. And so my question then, all of that falls away. The main question is the outdoor amenity space, 73 metres. Is that um, taking into account the building out of the other application site that is not to get built out but has planning permission and seems to be getting on with it with all the, all the building materials on site or not? Other questions? Councillor Bajant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that my clarification is very similar. Currently, this is being used by the restaurant as a garden, I understand. So will this be for the discrete use of these four occupancies, not for any of the further de future development? It's not part of that planning application. And will we, we can, we can definitely set a condition that that's got to be made free and not used by the restaurant. But if it, it's not much of a space to play football in, that's... Um, I mean, 70 metres is 10 by 7, isn't it? So that's 30 foot by 21 foot. It's not big for four flats. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions? No? OK, Jane. Uh, so in short, Chair, to your first question, yes, that is the overall space for all four flats not including the space that the so that's this area in pink you can zoom in a bit so that is all of this area here is the 73 so the flats so the houses to the south of that picture would have their own amenity space this would be for all four here and they would have only sole access to it on the ground floor plan so can i interrupt please a minute just to be clear to go back to that picture you just had on there on that image you showed with the shading, coloured shading, it shows the amenity area being 39 metres squared. That's not 72, 3. What, what have I misread? So, from reading of the report, this includes all of this here, is my understanding of it. I have to have a measure and come back to you if that's okay, Chair, just to clarify which part that includes. Yeah, okay. Yes, no, under paragraph 844, sorry, so the proposal will amend this external amenity space. So at the moment, it's 91 metres squared. 
So there's a total area of approximately 73, and this would include a landscape area, bin and cycle store. So yeah, this does include not only the pink bit, but also this orange bit as well. So this would be all that space. 73. And with regards to access to the area, from the ground floor plan, Shop units won't be able to access it out the back. They'd only have access to their bin spaces and it would just be the residents have access to the community cycle bin area out the back. Okay. Um, uh, my questions have been answered. There is amenity space, there are balconies. The look of the thing is a bit rudimentary, but um, acceptable to me. Um, that's where I am, Councillor Porra. Yeah, so just to clarify my understanding, the first floor flats don't have balconies or separate amenity space, but that was presumably consented under the previous local plan, I'm guessing, because it was 2018, so it would have gone in a bit earlier. So I'm assuming that we can't insist that they have defensible space now, even though they are actually coming back to planning technically. But this, the new space does have a separate private balcony for each of them, but they would also have some access to the amenity space at the bottom. Yeah. Thanks. Let's get that sorted. So are they coming back to planning technically, as Defence was said? Yes, yeah, so through your chair, yes. That would be that would be an old scheme. Um, and all the new flats have balconies and access to amenity space. Yes. OK, any more questions? No? OK. Uh, are you all clear? I know the drawings on that haven't been so clear, have they, really? But I think we've done a good job of trying to interrogate them. And thank you, Jane, for your help. In that case, we'll go to the vote then. So can we have the recommendation, please, Toby? Thanks, Chair. So the recommendation is set out on page 53 of the report pack, and that is to approve subject to the planning conditions as set out with minor amendments to the conditions as drafted, delegated to officers. Thank you. So the recommendation is one of approval, or there's in favour of that recommendation? Five in favour, <coughs> five in favour, Chair. Is it against? Okay. Sorry, there's to be clear. One, one against, was it? No, one abstention. One, okay, and abstentions? One. Okay, right, thank you. So that item is approved. Now, uh, are the people here for our King's College item? I think they are, aren't they? Yeah, good. Okay, great. Should we have a little break first? Because I know councillors have said they like little breaks now and again before between items just to freshen up a bit. It's a bit warm in here, isn't it? So let's have a five-minute break and come back to it at 22, and then we'll, we can get going on that one. So King's College next. Thank you very much, everyone. Do you want to turn the live stream off, please, Chris?
that please, Chris? Okay, welcome back, everyone. So, Planning Committee, next item is item nine, King's College Chapel. Uh, Mary Collins is the uh, case officer. And we've also got speakers, um, John Neill, Robin Uff, John Preston, um, Provost of King's College, Professor M. R. Proctor, don't know the first name, uh, Councillor Nsinga, uh, Councillor Holloway, and Councillor Smith, the last three being ward councillors. So, uh, Mary, if you want to introduce the item, then please. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm just trying to get my presentation up. It's just sort of disappeared. I'm sorry about that. Let me just find no it. Um, Here are you anyway, that's good. <laughs> good. Um, Oh, Mary. I'm really yeah. sorry. It's all right, don't worry. Sorry, don't say okay. sorry, it's all fine. We always say at the start, or I always say at the start, that if the case officer can't present the report because of some issue, then uh, Toby, on my right, will present the item for you. So you, you see if you can do it first, and then if not, then we'll get it presented here, because Toby has the presentation anyway. Yeah, I'm just trying to get my presentation on the same screen as... I'm afraid not, sir, no. Right, OK, I'll just try doing something to see if that works. Okay, great. We can see the presentation on screen, Mary. Yeah, so Chair, the, the problem I was having, I was trying to put my laser pointer on, but I think because I'm looking at this through a different system, I don't think I can turn the laser pointer on. It's okay, it's a sort of black arrow, which is better than a white arrow, and if you wiggle it around a bit, we can definitely see okay. that. So no worries, carry on. Right, okay. Okay, um, yeah, good afternoon, committee, and sorry for that um, slight delay. Um, right, okay, so the next item, it's King's College Chapel, which is in King's Parade, obviously in Cambridge. Um, I'd like to draw the committee's attention to the amendment sheet and the corrected energy generation and carbon saving figures that the, the applicant has um, given to us. Um, uh, this application seeks planning permission for the installation of photovoltaic panel arrays on the north and south slopes of King's College Chapel. Uh, the, the application is recommended for refusal. Um, the application site is on the western side of King's Parade and falls within the historical conservation area. The chapel is a Grade 1 listed building and is Cambridge's most recognisable and iconic building. The chapel and all the buildings of King's College sit within the Grade 2 star listed park and garden of special historic interest, which encompasses all the college's courts and gardens. 
including those west of the river and therefore forming part of the backs. So this shows some of the uh, context of the site with King's Parade here, um, Chapel here, um, the Gibbs Building here. Um, the chapel forms the north side of the first court, which is enclosed by buildings which are all grade one listed. They are the Fellows or Gibbs Building, which forms the west side, the screens and entrance gateway on King's Parade, which forms the east side and the south range of the first court here. Um, within first court are 12 lampposts and a fountain in the centre. All of these are grade two listed. Um, the chapel roof is nearly 300 foot long and laid without steps in mini roll lead, falling to lead parapet gutters. Although a large expanse, it is a plain practical roof with no decorative lead work and is largely concealed by the open parapet, pinnacles, upper turrets and battlements. Um, to the east of the chapel, uh, to the east of the chapel on the east side of the King's Parade is the Grade 1 listed church of St Mary the Great. So for this are a number of Grade 2 listed town buildings, generally shops and cafes with King's College student accommodation above. These form a continuous and attractive group along the east side of King's Parade and um, turn the corner into St Mary's Passage. Um, the site is within the city centre. It's within the air quality management area and located within the strategic district heating area. Um, the heritage assets, which would be affected by the proposal, were of the finest quality. The chapel is described in the Buildings of England series as the most magnific magnificent building of Cambridge and its greatest work of the Middle Ages. The neighbouring Gibbs building, which is here, as I've mentioned before, is described as the greatest collegiate building of the 18th, of 18th century Cambridge. These two great buildings are seen alongside each other in the magnificent views across the front court and the backs and great lawn. Um, the completion of the front court was left to William Wilkins in the 1820s, who designed the distinctive entrance from King's Parade and the South Range. There is further work to the south and west of the later 19th and 20th centuries. The landscaping was laid out between the 18th and 20th centuries and comprises a linear series of open spaces. Those at the front lawn, sorry, front court, great lawn and the backs provide an open and simple setting against which the buildings are seen. In addition to the architectural and aesthetic significance of King's College, it also derives a very high level of historical significance from the people associated with the college over the centuries. The exceptional significance of the college is reflected in the high designations. All the buildings um, which I've just mentioned are listed at grade one um, and the landscape at grade two star. Uh, the college also lies within the central Cambridge conservation area where it is appreciated in conjunction with the other colleges along the river. The conservation area appraisal illustrates the key positive views to the focal features of Gibbs Building, the Chapel and South Range of Clare College. Um, it states the views across the backs of the most frequently reproduced images of Cambridge, with the view of Clare College and King's College Chapel being the iconic image used to represent the university and city around the world. Um, the quality of these views is a combination of the green setting of the manicured lawns with wild, wider paddocks and the river with its traditional activity of punting and architecturally elaborate bridges. The spectacular architecture of the historic buildings acts as a focus of the view and um, there are no sort of buildings um, that sort of interrupt the, the views to the river. So I'll, I'll, that's setting the scene and giving the um, um, setting the scene. So 
as I've just mentioned, the, the uh, given the heritage assets identified of the very high significance, the weight that the council should give to their conservation should therefore be very considerable. Um, so I'll go on and describe the proposal itself. Um, so planning permission is proposed for the installation to, of 246 PV panels to each of the north and south slopes of the chapel roof. So it would be a total of 492 panels. The proposed panels are all black monocrystalline silicon panels, which will be fitted abutting each other. The panels would be inset from each end of the chapel roof by approximately five metres at the eastern end and by approximately four metres at the western end. The top edge of the installation, so I'm sure if you can see here, but this is the ridge line of the chapel. Um, the top edge of the installation would be 1.5 metres from the ridge line on the southern roof slope and approximately one metre on the northern slope and would extend approximately 5.5 metres. The number of fixings required to secure the arrays are relative to their overall area rather than a set number per panel. These are proposed to be spaced at 1.5 metre centres up the roof slope and across the length of the roof, resulting in four rows up the slope centred on every other bay. The fixings have been coordinated with the internal structure to ensure that there is no impact internally and also reversibility. As with the, any abutments or penetrations, the fixing points require minimum upstands and cover to ensure appropriate weather weathering is provided. The height of the panels above the lead will be approximately um, 230 millimetres. This will allow air to flow beneath the panels and to avoid prolonged wetting of the, roof, the lead covering to the chapel roof. Um, in terms of the principle of development, policies 29, 61 and 63 of the local plan are supportive of environmental improvements and energy generation, subject to the impact on the heritage asset being minimised. Policy 29 of the local plan states proposals for development involving the provision of renewable and or low carbon energy generation will be supported subject to the acceptability of their wider impacts. Potential impacts may be acceptable if they are minor or are outweighed by wider benefits, including the need for energy from renewable and low carbon sources, which will contribute to reducing carbon and other emissions. While the Council wishes to promote renewable and low carbon gen energy generation, there is also the need, as I say, to balance the desire against other objectives for Cambridge, such as protection and enhancement of the historic environment. Policy 63 of the local plan um, seeks to encourage proposals to enhance the environmental performance of heritage assets, provided that their design and specification ensures that the significance of the asset is not compromised by inappropriate interventions. The Council is committed to tackling climate change and reducing the carbon emissions of Cambridge. At the same time, the Council is committed to conserving the city's historic environment, particularly preserving and enhancing the character and appearance of its heritage assets. The Council's aim, therefore, is to ensure a balanced approach between protecting the heritage assets of Cambridge and ensuring that they contribute to tackling climate change and reducing the carbon emissions of the city. Acceptable levels of intervention will vary dependent dependent upon the impact on the significance of the heritage asset in question. Where works would harm the building's integrity or significance, that harm will be weighed against the public benefit of the, propo the proposal. In respect to the climate crisis, the framework's policies promote the provision of renewable energy, 
recognise constraints and encourage a strategic approach. These policies should be understood in the light of the government's target for the United Kingdom to reach net zero carbon by 2050. Any increased provision of renewable energy is to be taken as a public benefit. The National Planning Policy Framework Policy in respect of determination of applications for renewable energy generation states this clearly, and this accords with the government's target for the United Kingdom to reach net zero carbon by 2050. Um, so the, the key issues in this particular application are the impact of the proposal and the significance of the Grade 1 chapel and setting of other Grade 2 listed buildings, its impact on the parks and gardens of special interest, its impact on the historical conservation area, um, the carbon reduction and renewable energy generation that the scheme would provide and any public benefits. Um, so I'll just show you some, go through some of the plans, just showing the details of the, the panels that are proposed. Um, this, um, as you can see, is just the mock-up um, that was put on the, the roof. So certain assessments and so on could be made. Um, this yeah, shows the roof plan showing the inset from the end of the, the chapel and um, the position in terms of relation with the ridge line. This is the east end. Um, this shows that the actual solar panels would be set down from the parapet. Um, this shows a section showing approximately the projection above the roof plane uh, in relation to the, the pinnacles of each side. It's just an idea giving an idea of the fixing points that are required. Um, another one just showing the size of the proposed panel, again in relationship to the, the pinnacles and the ridge of the roof. Right, so now I'm going to just um, talk about the carbon savings and energy generation of the proposal. Um, so the, the generation potential of the panels is 128,000 and 62 kilowatt hour per year with a carbon saving of 27 um, kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. So that's 27, approximately 27 tonnes. All forms of energy generation, centralised and decentralised, will have a carbon payback. And this relates to the time it will take for the operation of the panels to offset the amount of carbon generated by the manufacturer of the panels. The figures um, provided um, suggest a 4.5 year carbon payback for the south slope and 6.4 year payback for the north slope. These are considered to, to have a good, good, good payback period. So this um, slide taken from the, the assessment that shows um, this is the, the proposed option. These various colours mean um, optimizers and inverters, so other things that are adding to the embodied carbon, but also improving the efficiency of the solar panels. Um, in the view that our sustainability officer, um, Oh, sorry, it is the view of the sustainability officer that um, in the first few years of their operation, that carbon saved from the generation of zero carbon electricity will effectively offset the carbon emitted in the manufacturing process as they won't be emitting more carbon. 
Um, well, that's, yeah. So this slide is just um, a large version of what I've just shown you, just showing the various makeup of the structure, the panels, everything that would have imported carbon is all just listed in this, this diagram here. So both roof slopes have been assessed by the applicant to indicate the suitability of the roof for solar energy generation. These have been classified as moderately suitable. So this is on the south slope and slightly suitable um, for the north slope. Um, this is an assessment which takes into account orientation and inclination of the roof and shading factors which would block direct sunlight. So the college undertook a feasibility study of all the buildings in the main sort of areas. We've got the Gibbs building, the South Court and the chapel here, um, just to indicate which areas would be more suitable for sort of PV on the roofs. Um, as the chapel has two different roof slopes with different orientations, there will always be a difference in the amount of yield that each slope will generate. South is clearly the optimum orientation for photovoltaic panels. So it's only normal for there to be a drop in yield on roof slopes that are not orientated south. So in, in, the, um, in my report, um, it's noted that um, the, south, the north slope would have 60% of the south slope. Um, so it's not unusual for there to be a difference in yield between roof slopes. Um, but this is normally dealt with by each roof slope having its own inverter or through the use of microinverters, which is the case with this proposal. Microinverters are to be used, which will enable each roof slope array to operate independently. Um, the applicant has confirmed that energy generation significantly exceeds the power requirement of the chapel itself in any one year. The surplus will be exported from the chapel to be used on site in the rest of the college electricity network. The power needs of the chapel will be 100% met. The 1.7% figure of the total measures over the overall dom domus needs, needs will actually increase over time, with the power produced by the chapel PV representing a higher proportion of the diminishing energy need of the whole estate. The actual carbon savings, the college um, note, are material year on year. By generating this non-emitting power on site, it also means that the green power in the grid can go to some other use. So, um, in terms of policy and um, national policy, um, any increased provision of renewable energy is to be taken as a public benefit. The National Planning Policies Framework policy in respect to the determination of applications for renewable energy states this clearly. And this accords with the government's target uh, for the United Kingdom to reach net zero carbon by 2050. So in terms of the impact actually on the heritage assets, um, just give a bit of background on the proposal. Um, so works to places of worship, such as the chapel, are exempt from listed building consent, as set out in the planning, listed building and the ecclesiastical exemption, listed buildings and conservation areas, England Order 2020. And so the committee will not be, we, we have not got an application for listed building consent and do not need one. Planning applications, which is what this application before us is, need to be determined in the light of the statutory test, the 1990 Planning, Listed Buildings and Conservation Act. 
Section 66 requires that the local plan authority must have special regard to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting or any features of special architectural or historic interest which it possesses when determining planning applications for permission uh, for development which affects a listed building. When determining the planning application, the local planning authority will detail regard for all relevant aspects of the NPPF and local plan. In normal circumstances, the local planning authority is both the determining is both determining the planning application and a listed building application. The MPPF does not set out specific advice for the determination of applications where the listed building component is to be dealt with under an ecclesiastical exemption. Therefore, the LPA needs to include a consideration of the balance of harm to the listed building, as well as the wider issues of setting and impact on the conservation area. So um, officers consider that um, owing to their shiny surface and reflective nature, that the solar panels proposed would pick up the changing tone and perhaps colour of the sky. Um, and so it would shift from light to dark under changing skies. The appearance of the panels and by extension the roof would change as clouds pass overhead, showing as white with cloud cover and black when the when the sky cleared. So it's the it's considered the solar panels would therefore have a dynamic nature that is very different to the more static and recessive nature of the lead roof. It is considered that the proposal would effect, in effect lay a reflective screen across the greater part of both roof slopes. The visual impact of the panels would vary according to viewpoint and brightness. There is a concern that the panels would not appear a recessive in the way the light toned existing lead covering does. It would have a shinier surface and would be capable of, de of detracting from the appearance of the building. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to show you some of the uh, visualizations um, and points where the roof would be, be visible, the roof and therefore the panels. Um, so yeah, this is looking to towards the front uh, north elevation of King's College Chapel. It's close up there. So I think you've got all these in, in the planning pack, but I will just briefly go through them. But these are the main viewpoints where the roof would be, be visible. And these are all been assessed um, as part of the planning application. So hopefully I'm not going through these too quickly and you're able to see them as I flick, flick through. And we have, um, there were, um, some views that were not um, put within the sort of views of the, the panels, this one being from Silver Street and Queen's Lane, where you've got a view of the south side of the, the roof slope. And uh, another one has been further afield, but you can still see quite clearly the, the roof. So you, by extension, you would see the panels. Um, so with the, the PV panels in place, the roof would become a more prominent feature of the building with the roof att attracting attention. So officers consider consider this alteration of the balance of architectural composition 
from the lesser role played by the roof covering to the significance of the overall building. So the more prominent role it would play would harm the architectural significance of the building. Um, so on the count of this reflective quality, um, officers consider that in most of these views, the, the actual PV panels would be quite conspicuous in, in the view. Um, so views from various points within the city as well um, have a, a good view of the chapel skyline as well as its architectural composition. Therefore, um, it's considered that um, in many of the views, it would be detrimental to the, the appearance of the of the chapel. Um, so, when the full significance of the chapel is considered, the degree of harm to the sum of the chapel significance is considered to be modest, but it is also less than substantial harm. So, as harm has been identified to the significance of the Grade One listed chapel, and by extension the park and garden and conservation area, any harm or loss requires a clear and convincing justification in accordance with paragraph 200 of the MPPF. Um, so officers have concluded that proposals give rise to less than substantial harm of moderate significance. And this requires that the identified harm is weighed up against the public benefits of the proposal. So as we've, um, as I've discussed earlier, the increased provision of renewable energy is a public benefit and is an important part of reaching net zero carbon targets and responding to the climate emergency. Um, in this instance, there are public benefits in terms of sustainability. The proposal would result in a cleaner environment in the city centre through the reduction in carbon emissions. The aim of supplying more energy to the college sustainably is a beneficial one. The PV panels to the chapel roof would contribute to a 1.7% reduction in carbon consumption across the entire measures proposed for the estate. However, it's considered that the harm to the significance of the Grade 1 listed building is not outweighed by the sustainability improvements that would arise. Um, so to conclude, um, by virtue of the addition of PV panels, the proposal would apply a roof covering of a radically different character and appearance than the traditional lead roof. The application of the PV panels would visually detract from the architectural character of the roof and skyline and be discordant with the architectural composition of this exceptional and historically iconic medieval building. Important views of the chapel would be harmed, damaging the appreciation of the chapel's architectural interest and in eroding its authenticity and integrity. In doing so, the proposal would result in less than substantial harm to the significance of the Grade 1 listed chapel, particularly its aesthetic and historical values, but also its setting. The proposal would also harm the character and appearance of the central conservation area through harm to the appearance of the listed building and its impact on important views of the chapel, the setting of the chapel and other nearby listed buildings. The public benefits from the proposal arising from its carbon reduction potential are not sufficient in the view of officers um, to outweigh the identified harm to the Grade 1 listed chapel that would arise as a result of the proposal. So the recommendation is therefore for refusal. 
So I hope that's okay, Chair. But I, I'm not sure very good. Thank you. Yep. Very yeah. clear. In that case, we'll go to the speakers now, then, please. So the first, well, we've got three objectors to speak. Well, one to speak and two um, statements to be read. So John Neil, you're here. Hello, John. Good afternoon. Um, so if you want to take your seat there at the public speaker space. And you're going to speak, and then um, James will read out two statements from two other objectors, Robin Uff and John Preston, who couldn't attend today. So there's a total of six minutes speaking time for all three of you. Um, you go ahead, and then we'll stop the clock before we read the statements out. So you need to press the button on the right-hand side there in front of you. And um, when you're ready, thanks. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm going to cover three broad subjects, the significance of the chapel, the impact of the proposals, and the balancing exercise in which it falls to you to perform. Significance. King's College Chapel is one of England's finest buildings. It's a masterpiece of the perpendicular style, England's late Gothic, and a building of European resonance. It's also, I should add, a building which has been very well cared for for half a millennium by the college. Sometimes with familiarity, one stops seeing, so I would invite members to look at the chapel afresh. It is, of course, the interior, which is most extraordinary. But that said, the chapel's exterior is a monumental work of art in its own right. And the upper parts, the skyline, the boldly modelled turrets, the finials, the open-work parapet through which one sees the lead-coloured roof, and their interplay against the sky make an important contribution to the chapel's significance. Impact. Historic England considers that the proposed installation of solar panels would harm the chapel's significance to a modest degree, as your officer has suggested. To understand the impact, one needs to understand what the proposed panels would do or what they would look like. Photographs from the ground are not enough. One needs to look closely at the panels first and then consider how they would be seen from the ground. Seen on the roof, the sample panels showed the clouds and the chapel's turrets reflected in them, not clearly as in a mirror, but reflected nonetheless. And from the ground, one could see the sample panels change from light gray to black and back to light gray within a matter of minutes. The panels would form a reflective screen. From the Tower of Great St. Mary's, an important viewpoint over Cambridge, the result would be startling and discordant. And from the ground, the effect would also be disturbing. The panels above, or seen above or through the parapet would cause the roof to shift and change shade and colour at times rapidly. Of course, the shade of the lead changes too, but not at all to this degree. The effect would be to detract from the architectural character of the chapel, not in all views, but in important views. And so to the balancing exercise. The difficulty of determining this application is that it involves a choice between two things, both of which are important and both of which are good. Cambridge's planning policies and those of government, as you've heard, rightly encourage the, the provision of renewable energy, and the college's proposals would achieve this. It is a response to the climate emergency. At the same time, local and national policies recognise constraints, and the conservation of the historic environment may be one such constraint. Historic England's position is simple. The exceptional significance of King's College Chapel is such that the greatest weight must be attached to its conservation. The proposals would cause harm, modest harm, to its significance. And this is something which it would reason be reasonable to conclude could render the proposal unacceptable. We note that in its favour, the production of renewable energy is desirable and would be a public benefit. The quantity of that benefit would be modest in the context of the college's own carbon emissions and still more so in a city-wide basis. But the balancing exercise is not for us, but for you. Historic England's recommendation is that you should refuse this application unless you conclude that the benefits of renewable energy would outweigh the consequent harm to Cambridge's finest building and a building of European resonance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, John. So, James, if you want to read out the two statements, then please. Just say which one is which and who's speaking, who, who it is. First statement from uh, Robin Uff, objector. Uh, he's a conservation and design consultant. 
King's College Chapel is a Grade One listed building and of, and of outstanding interest and national importance. It is one of the most important architectural, historic, and aesthetically iconic buildings in England, Europe, and the world. It is a focal building in a highly prominent location within the Cambridge Conservation Area. The need for urgent, effective response to the climate emergency is fully endorsed. Every opportunity to develop sustainable, renewable, green technology is to be wholeheartedly encouraged, but only where any impact would be reasonable and not unduly harmful. The proposed provision of large arrays of black reflective panels attached to and above the existing plane of the lead roofs would, it is considered, damage the integrity of the building. It has been established that there will indeed be some, albeit limited and partially restricted, views to the proposed new building covering. Even if the black panels can only be glimpsed through or over the pierced parapet from ground level and around, this would be more than sufficient to diminish the appearance and character of the roof and contrast with the grey lead roof. Lead is surely the true conservation replacement reinstating the correct sympathetic original historic roofing material. The upper part of the chapel creating the highly sensitive silhouette skyline comprising the roof, parapet and distinctive architectural masonry detail together form a key defining intrinsic part of the exterior appearance, special interest, character and significance of the chapel itself and its setting. I have advised over many years on proposed PV panels to the roofs of listed buildings, some to grade one listed buildings and churches. The established good practice approach is always to carefully weigh the balance of the positives of sustainability against the negatives of undesirable change. Just knowing and being aware that such additions have been installed upon the chapel roof would be detrimental to an image and impression in one's mind's eye, thinking of this fine building at the special and wholly unique qualities of the chapel. Some historic buildings, just a very few, are so important that any degree of such damaging change must result in disproportionate level of harm and have a clear negative impact to its essential significance, special character and spirit of the place. We are up to six minutes, Chair, but there's basically six lines from Mr Preston, if you have to say that. Uh, so, from Mr. Preston's statement, um, I would have spoken at this meeting, but um, am unable to attend the committee because I'll be chairing a board meeting of the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance, which brings together sustainable heritage and mainstream construction industry interests to tackle the challenges exemplified by this application. I strongly support the officer's report and recommendation. My comments set out further reasons why the college have not made their case. They were, I think, added to the portal chair. So that's six and a half minutes. Thanks for reading those out, James. So I'll use my chair's prerogative to allow to go past six minutes. So, so six and a half minutes. So if the applicant wishes to use some extra time, it's available to them. So the next speaker is the Provost of King's College. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. So if you want to take your place at the public speaker stand there. So six and a half minutes if you need it. Um, Press the button on the right-hand side, and the thing should light up. And and uh, a bell will go sort of half a minute before the end, let, just to let you know you're coming to the end of your time if you get that far. But uh, when you're ready, thank you. Thank you. I, I speak as the Provost of King's on behalf of the governing body, the students, and the staff of King's College. As we've heard, the decision today, or that you will take, rests largely on balancing the public benefits associated with the installation of the PV panels with any potential harm they pose to the his, his heritage significance of the chapel. This harm, deemed by both Historic England and the planning officers to be less than substantial, minor, is not related to the physical fabric of the chapel. And I should emphasize here that the panels are not permanent features of the roof if installed. They can be removed later without damage to the fabric uh, if technology makes them not needed in the future. We take our responsibilities on this point very seriously, and we acknowledge there will be some glimpses of the PV from limited viewpoints in the city, though not, I should emphasize, from the west side, the famous view across the river. 
The smallest of its impact has been reinforced by the fact that the test panels installed during last year's feasibility study went almost universally unnoticed, with no very few remarks made to us. In the context of the climate emergency, we consider the very minimal visual impact caused by the panels to be insignificant compared with the substantive benefits associated with their installation, as articulated in the letter from Lucy Netzinger, councillor for Newnham, which I believe has reached you. The panels will make a considerable quantifiable environmental impact, more than fulfilling the entire energy demands of the chapel, reducing our reliance on the national grid, at a saving in the region of 27 tonnes of carbon dioxide each year, as you will have heard. Even after factoring in the payback of the embodied carbon of the panels themselves, the cost of not implementing the proposed panels would equate to the emission of approximately 410 tonnes of carbon dioxide between now and 2050. This quantity may be conceptually difficult for us to envisage, but it does not seem to us to be trivial or insubstantial. This installation is part of a college-wide program of renewable electricity. PV panels are already installed on several of the college's buildings. And in this regard, the chapel is not simply one possible option, but part of a wider strategy that encompasses all potential sites. While each element may not be large, the impact of the whole is very significant. This site is particularly important for the strategy as no other viable surface or area within the entire college grounds can deliver the electrical output of the proposed array of panels on the chapel roof. The proposal is an integrated element of the college's decarbonisation strategy and of our committed response to the climate emergency, which encompasses a wide-ranging programme of actions, from improving insulation and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels to constructing new carbon net zero buildings. We have set a target, an ambitious one, of achieving net zero by 2038. Our students, staff and fellows are fully behind this initiative and our drive to reduce our carbon out footprint. It seems also that the diocese is also supportive, as we have just heard today that a faculty has been granted for this work, which I understand is equivalent to listed building consent in the context of an ecclesiastical building. So we think that in the context of the climate emergency, these measures are not merely beneficial, they are in fact essential. If we as a college, as a university, and as a city are serious about decarbonisation, we have to be prepared to take action. For our own part, we do not see this proposal as an opportunity, we see it as an urgent and vital necessity. Thank you. Yep, thanks very much. I just realised the next statements are actually to be read out, not, not councillors to speak. So it's uh, Councillor Singer, Councillor Holloway and Councillor Smith. So I'm going to have to put upon you again, I'm afraid, James, if you don't mind reading them out. Do you need any help? Are you OK? OK. So there's three statements to be read. Um, unlimited time. Oh, Councillor Bennett, yes. Councillor Holloway is actually present. So, Councillor Holloway, do you want to, uh, well, actually, should we take Luke, Councillor Singer first? Is she's in first in all? Oh, no, you're on screen, so you go first then, Councillor. No, go on. You, you go first. Doesn't really make much difference. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I submitted the written statement. And speak up a bit, will you, please, Cameron? Oh. Sorry, yes. Hello. So, thank you very much. I'm a, as a ward councillor in Newnham, I strongly support this proposal. And I'm very grateful to King's College for the work that's gone into it. Placing PV panels on the roof of such an iconic building would be very powerful as a symbol of Cambridge's commitment to the transition to net zero. And it would make a positive contribution to renewable energy production for King's College as well. Policy one of the local plan is the presumption in favour of sustainable development. And this includes this meeting the city's needs now and in the future. Placing PV panels on top of King's College Chapel strikes me as exactly the type of ambitious yet pragmatic project that's needed to ensure that Cambridge's historic buildings will be there to be enjoyed for centuries to come. 
so exactly the type of project that would meet the city's needs now and long into the future. Objections refer to a change in character, but I do not believe that this change would be significant. The view of the chapel from the ground would be almost entirely unchanged. Furthermore, the lead roofing is clearly already of a different era to the rest of the chapel, so the addition of PV panels would not, in my view, compromise the chapel's architectural composition or its character. Indeed, if the character of the area is considered, King's College Chapel would join nearby major landmarks which already have solar panels on their roofs, such as Great St Mary's and the Guild Hall. The danger to passing aircraft should of course be taken into account, but this should not in my view be enough to refuse this proposal. The minor potential harms are outweighed by the major benefits of this scheme. The PV panels will directly save 23 tonnes of carbon per year over their 30 year life, or 690 tonnes in total. This is in itself significant, but it is the indirect impact of this scheme that I will believe I believe will be most powerful. Carbon Neutral Cambridge notes that if the 300,000 paying visitors to King's Chapel each year were, on average, inspired to reduce their personal carbon footprint by just 1%, it would indirectly save 30,000 tonnes of carbon a year, more than 5% of Cambridge's entire direct carbon emissions. King's College Chapel is a world famous landmark, as has been noted, and adding PV panels to its roof would be symbolic of the climate leadership Cambridge can and should show on the world stage. For these reasons, I urge the committee to support this application. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Holloway. OK, so um, James, if you want to read those other two statements out then, please. <laughs> Uh, first statement from Councillor Lucy Nessinger. I am writing to support the application for solar PV on the roof of King's College Chapel. I have looked at and noted the objections from the Council's Conservation Officer and from Historic England, but I would never, nevertheless urge the committee to approve the application. The impact of the solar PV panels on the visual appearance of the chapel will be minimal and is recognised in the Conservation Officer's report, with the impact in sending a national message that it is not only possible, but desirable for the roofs of historic buildings to help to contribute to the need to tackle the climate emergency would be enormous. There is no doubt that King's College Chapel is a building of worldwide architectural importance. A solar PV to be installed on such a building would demonstrate that it is possible for even buildings at this level of importance to make their contribution to moving towards a zero carbon future. Buildings such as King's College Chapel should not be regarded as to be preserved without change over the centuries. Many, many changes have been made to the chapel over the centuries, including the installation of the organ and of electric lighting both of which have been major changes moving the chapel forward at, at times. Expectations in technology changed. Both will have made a significant difference to the appearance of the chapel, far larger than this proposal, but I'm sure we would all recognise these changes as beneficial to our appreciation of the building and worship within it. For our time, the greatest emergency we face is the impact of climate change, which will affect our historic buildings as well as the natural world. It is my strong view that any possible detrimental visual impact of the installation of panels, and I do not personally believe the panels will cause detriment, is enormously outweighed by the positive benefits of installing panels on the roof. This benefit is not only that of generating electricity on a large south facing surface, but also the perhaps even more important message that this is sent to those managing other historic buildings. If King's College can take this step carefully and wisely with their chapel, then many other buildings of historic importance can also help to contribute to tackling the biggest challenge of our time, the climate emergency. I urge the committee to support the application, uh, Councillor Lucy Nessinger. Statement from Councillor Simon Smith. In this submission to the Planning Committee, I refer to the core matter for consideration, the planning balance between conservation of the historic environment and mitigating and adapting to climate change, Local Plan Policy 29. 
In this case, the balance is between harm to the character of King's College Chapel as perceived from street level and higher and aerial views of the chapel and the public benefits of renewable energy and consequent reduction of CO2 emissions. National Planning Policy Framework Para 199 is arguably the most relevant policy which advises local plan authorities. When considering the impact of a proposed development on the significance of a designated heritage asset, great weight should be given to the asset's conservation and the more important the asset, the greater the weight should be. This is irrespective of whether any potential harm amounts to substantial harm, total loss or less substantial harm to its significance. On the question of harm, the conservation officer's assessment concludes there would be modest adverse impact. Given minimal harm, justification to approve rests with the weight to be given to public benefit in the form of renewable energy. Specialists in the field of historic building conservation have present, presented cases for refusal based on harm. Less has been said on the public benefits. In approving, the committee would be creating public benefit. For the college, the proposed forms an important element of its sustainability vision, strategy, and a comprehensive, highly innovative program to be net zero by 2038. For the city, this program presents an exemplar to property owners and businesses, an inspiration to every one of us. For the world, the generation of renewable energy on the roof of the chapel will send a message that we all need to take climate change seriously. In conclusion, we need to have at the forefront of our minds that climate change is resulting in catastrophic, irreversible harm to life on Earth. Our prime responsibility must be to take every opportunity to reduce carbon emissions, however modest, and not to be distracted in that mission by minimal harm to a single historic building. I invite the Planning Committee to support the Conservation Officer's advice to consider a temporary permission for the 20 to 30 year life of the panels, a very modest time frame in the life of this 500 year old building. This would allow for a review of modest adverse impacts of the panel's progress against the 2050 target for a new zero, for a net zero world. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Okay, councillors. That was an hour of talking, so let's get on with the business. Um, all very important, of course, and thank you very much to the speakers. And of course, the councillors can say what they like, and it's a bit unusual, really, in a way, because normally ward councillors sort of support often objectors in their wards, you like something. They're more sort of talking about the thing itself, like sustainability and so on. And um, of course, that's all very pertinent, and especially if the content is useful. So by all means, take account of that if you feel it's pertinent to the item we're considering today. Just to say, um, you know, we're democratically elected here to make decisions for this, the people of this city. And we've got an item in front of us. It's quite sort of an interesting one in some ways. Um, but, you know, and like those councillors just spoke, we are sitting on planning committee. We sit on a quasi-judicial <coughs> committee. We need to consider items in terms of the national planning policy framework, the local plan, local plans policies and such like. So that's our job today. I think it'd be good if, if we could try to um, constrain ourselves to maybe questions towards the start of this debate of the officer and others. And by the way, Christian Brady, the conservation officer, is here today, so he can help at all if if Mary feels she would like to delegate anything to him to answer. And, and obviously then, you know, I don't want to constrain you, councillors, but any, I would say any rhetorical debate attempts to co co convince us all of one point of view might be a bit later in the debate usefully. Um, but up to you, really, in the end. So, councillors, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to raise page 112... Uh, 6.1, response of statutory consultee, Cambridge Airport, um, who object to the proposal unless a condition requiring a glint and glare assessment is applied to any planning permission. I do not want to prejudge the decision of my fellow councillors, but uh, could I ask that should the decision be made to approve this proposal, that such a condition be added. Yeah, very good point, Councillor. Thank you. I thought the same myself. Any other? Yes, Councillor Gawthrop-Wood. Is it possible?
or to have a condition or a informative uh, put in, which is that King's College in the future look at different sorts of panels as they're developed, which have less glint or reflectivity, we'll say. Um, and that, that's something that, of course, one of the people that the provost noted himself. Um, the other thing is, all right, King's College have done a, a trial. Um, I did wonder, now, clearly you can remove panels. It's a bit harder to remove the, um, the tracks and the things that go through the roof. So, I mean, I assume that, this is to ask the officer, that King's have done due diligence that the roof won't get damaged and you don't get a leak. I know that we've had two, um, we've got, two, yeah, the, we've got one um, diagram showing of the roof showing the fixing points um, and another showing um, how the, the pitch and how the frame works. Um, so that's the second question. Um, I also wanted to check because I think um, Mary said something about the electricity would feed into King's own electricity network. Is it feeding into their network or to the grid? Um, yeah. Uh, I'll leave it for that, for that, that there for now. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor uh, Bajant. Chair, a simple question to start. If a panel needs to be replaced because it fails, will it stand out? Will it look different? Will it be significantly different? Or will King's College have some spare panels left out to weather so they will be able to replace a, a panel along the way? Hey, thanks, Councillor. A bit of a technical question, but we'll see what can be done. Uh, Councillor Porra. Thank you, Chair. I'll just go with questions. Could the officer just comment the ecclesiastical exemption, which I think the speaker said has now been supported, which I'm taking as a positive. I was a little uncomfortable about sort of doing the two out of sync, just whether they could comment if that is in effect the equivalent of a list of building consent. So we're saying that the church bodies have accepted the public benefit. Secondly, were this to be, oh, the Glinton Clare has been covered by Councillor Bennett. Um, I think one of the objectors, the Society for Preservation of Ancient Buildings, I believe, talked about lack of confidence that the other measures have been adopted. I think I'd submitted a question to the planning officer, and I gather that they have been adopted across the site, but I'd just be grateful if the officer could clarify that that is the case. So I think the objection was on the grounds that we shouldn't be putting panels on there before we start doing the other stuff. But I think my understanding is other stuff has already been done, though. I wondered if, I don't know whether it would be Christian or the off, uh, Mary could comment. Obviously, public benefit in planning terms is often, um, well, public benefit. We've talked about leading the way as a public benefit. So I'd just be grateful for some comments about how much weight we could give that. So, you know, using this as an exemplar that if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. So I'm not sure quite how that sits with public benefit in terms of the MPPF. And finally, picking up on Councillor Gawthrop Wood's point, um, I know some, I think at least one speaker talked about time limited. I'm not sure personally whether a time limit with an arbitrary stop date is helpful, but I would like to ask officers if they consider something to say that should the panels become redundant, they have to be taken off the roof. Yeah, because obviously this is 500 year old building and these panels may only be useful for 10, 15 years if tech changes. And what I wouldn't want is for them to be left, you know, not functioning. So I'd be grateful if you could comment on that and pick you up on Councillor Gawthrow's point about whether, you know, there's a presumption they could be replaced with more planning permission in future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so I'll just underline what one, one thing that Councillor Porras said there. I think it'd be useful, uh, Mary, if you could just, I mean, you've made a very clear presentation, but just maybe go over the uh, public benefit matters and the less than, less than substantial harm measurements because that seems to be something of the crux of the question here for us today. Um, Councillor Gawthrop-Wood. 
again on further clarification of the other measures that the report uh, yeah the report that I think King's commissioned Max Fordham and the decarbonisation report it seemed to me reading that and this is something I'd like clarified that the other that the reduction in carbon emissions of only what was it 1.4 percent by these panels the other things that were proposed it wasn't um, it wasn't clear to me whether they were would be that easy to do because it's not just panels I'd have thought it's things like insulation and stuff like that um, I am going to say this that this is equivalent to 128 houses of my of houses of my size that I live in this will be producing 128 houses worth of kilowatt hours per year we'll, we'll take your word for it on the numbers yeah, so, I've okay. just, I worked that out know, so. thank you I know you're an expert in solar panels <laughs> anything else okay back to Mary then please and then we'll go on with some more questions or rhetoric after that if you need to make any statements thanks right Mary okay uh, thanks chair I'll, I'll go through yes yeah, some of the um, questions that were brought up yeah so feeding into the network um, the app yeah the applicant has confirmed that um, the power needs of the chapel will be 100% met by this uh, by the solar panels um, but it will also be then going into the wider um, college network and then any surplus to that would then go into the the main grid. That's my understanding of that. Um, so. Um, with regards to um, the impact of actually putting the supports for the PV on the roof, that's more an issue for the, the faculty rather than, so what would normally have been listed building consent in this instance, it's the faculty. So that would have been um, issues that they would be taking into account, the, the actual harm to the historic fabric, whether the roof, you know, can support the the panels and yet if there's any harm through the actual supports themselves going into the lead covering but the lead is actually being renewed at the moment and lead is a sort of product that has got a lifetime to it so occasionally it does need to be renewed anyway so it, in terms of historic fabric it may not be as old as other parts of the the chapel um, in terms of weathering of the panels, I don't know if they do actually experience a weathering impact. So I don't know if they do change their appearance over time due to that. Um, so I would imagine if a new panel, if, if a panel failed for any reason, then it would be easy to put a, a, the same specification panel in, which would... Um, obviously match with the remaining panels. Um, in terms of putting a condition, a time limiting condition, um, so, you know, if we were to support the application and approve it, um, it may be hard to put that sort of condition on because we wouldn't want to, res we would obviously want the panels to be there long enough for them to actually get some sort of payback and to generate some electricity um, rather than so it would need to be for quite a long period if we were, were to do that um, if we are minded to approve there would be a condition to say that um, if if they're no longer required for any reason that they're removed as soon as is you know, as soon as is practical that's what we would do with most applications for solar panels in in any event um, 
in terms of the so in terms of the faculty which has been so they have um, in effect granted listed building consent they're only looking at the impact on the fabric of the listed building they're not they're not looking at the um, the public benefits that would um, arise from the development so they as part of that um, assessment they would not do a balancing um, a balance between um, the benefits of the carbon production against the, the, the you know the harm to the the historic building historic chapel um, so hopefully that's answered a few questions for the time being Jay should I um, go back to you and see if that's, that's yeah. yeah if that answers yeah no, thanks, Mary. I'll just check with councillors. Anything missed out, councillors, that you didn't get an answer to? No, that's all good. OK. Any more questions or comments on the item from Mary or us? Councillor Porra. I think I was just asking about the adoption of other me measures. So I asked if one of the consultees says the college is doing this as a first stop, first port of call, but I understand from the college they're not. They've already done other stuff. And secondly, it was just that public... Uh, it's the public benefit of being an exemplar versus the public benefit of green electricity, I suppose, is what I'm asking for clarification on. So, Mary, those things? Yes, yeah, so any, any carbon savings are considered to be a public benefit. So, I so even if it was a very, very small scheme, um, we would say, I think, in terms of national policy, that there is a benefit and that, you know, that there is a public benefit to the scheme. So obviously, the more that's being produced is perhaps a greater benefit. Um, but I would argue that um, the benefits, as we know, have to be uh, balanced against the harm to the the heritage asset. Um, so even if it's an exemplar scheme, if we still feel that there's harm to the significance of the Grade One Chapel, um, then um, they would still outweigh um, the public benefits from the carbon saving and energy generation. Um, so, Sorry, was that it? Case, uh, no, no, I was just, else? no, I was, I was just going to, yes, yeah, so Councillor Porra's other question was about um, uh, what King's College have done in um, in response to other measures, and that they've said to us that they have um, provided other measures. Um, so just bear with me. And Toby to help with that question, she he was saying. Uh, no, um, right. So yeah. Um, so the applicant has got back to us to say that the college fellowship has in fact completely embraced the Max Fordham report and has declared its goal of seeking net zero by 2038. The college currently has commissioned work to identify what fabric improvements are required to each and every room slash building on the college estate. Um, and the supporting heritage evaluations to judge effects and what are real opportunities. The college has committed extensive funds and will continue to do this. Once these technical studies are complete, they will then turn to funding existing technologies, likely ground source heat pumps, to decarbonise heat, thus enabling college reliance on fossil fuels to be reduced. So, yeah, so they have confirmed that they are, they have now embraced that report. Okay, um, thanks, Mary. Uh, Toby's just going to add something to that as well. Go on, Toby. I think just, just specifically, Chair, 
the, the college has already implemented two PV installations, one at Wilkins Hall, which was a roof-mounted array, and another at the old garden hostel. Uh, the first was um, 21, um, you know, that's 1,000 um, kilowatt roof-mounted array. The, the other was a, a, a 12 kilowatt one. So, um, and obviously they're, they're, they're looking at also um, um, heat pump installation, installations for the future, possibly connecting into the additional electricity supply that the PV from the uh, chapel, if it were granted, could um, help with in terms of energy and running. Thank you. OK, thanks, Toby. Uh, OK, Mary. I wonder, Mary, would it be useful for Christian Bady, the conservation officer, to comment on the first point about the benefit, the the um, less than substantial harm and public benefit question and anything else, perhaps? Would that be useful, Mary, do you think? Yes, if Christian's happy to answer that, yes. Yeah, yeah go ahead then, Christian. You, I think you've got to turn your camera on or... Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Um, I don't feel as though I have uh, particular ownership of that uh, point. Um, it, it's a moot point, clearly. The idea of uh, an exemplary demonstration of the response to carbon saving sort of stacks up against the great heritage weight that needs to be given to considering this grade one listed building and one could almost balance them <laughs> in that respect but as i say um it's really a, a general i think planning question um i the question about the weight of public benefits now, i don't feel as though i have a you know, as i said unique ownership at that point. I think it's very much not only for um, other planning officers, but also, of course, for the committee to to um, make their own views on that. OK, Christian, that's that's fair enough. Thanks very much for that. Obviously, you're available if councillors want to ask any questions, particularly yeah. pertinent to your specialism. Uh, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank all the public speakers and Officer Mary Collins for being so clear. Um, there's just one more point that I'd like to raise. Um, this is not the first time that we've considered the affairs of King's College at this meeting. And at previous meetings, we've expressed concerns about the admissions charges to King's College Chapel that restrict um, the public benefit of living uh, near this beautiful building. If we do not allow the college to make these energy and cost-saving measures, is it not likely that admission charges will have to raise, rise even further and that the benefits of public access will be reduced? It's an interesting point, Councillor. It's not really a planning matter, though. Any more points, Councillors? Councillor Pageant. Thank you, Chair. King's College is an extremely significant building, a landmark that is recognisable throughout the UK. We have the weight of history on our shoulders today. We really do. In many ways, this chapel is symbolic of our city, the city that we've been elected to represent. It's an icon. Should we sit here and defend what we have? Or should we challenge and move forward? Should we be radical? Should we recognise that this city is on the cusp of having to take several really important decisions this year? Decisions that could significantly affect our role as a world leader. There is the possibility of unintended consequences, probably consequences that are not in the planning rules. We have an opportunity to promote change, accepting that we can alter or allow P 
people to alter. One of the greatest buildings in this country is a symbol of what I've said is Cambridge. It will be significant in the world's fight against carbonisation. Less significantly, but also of great importance, we are also on the cusp of an important decision about congestion in this city. Nonetheless, we as a world leader need to be bold. To show the way, I will support this application. Okay, thanks, Councillor. I mean, that's, that's all debate before we get a conclusion. So, um, Councillor Collis. Thanks, Chair. I did have my hand up before. Um, we're committed, all of us, in particularly as a council, to a zero, zero carbon future for Cambridge. Um, we lead on it as a council, but we have also called on other uh, organisations and institutions, including the university and its constituent colleges, to play their part as well. You know, we're asking them to show leadership alongside us, and I think in this proposal they are. There's huge um, potential for public benefit here. I think it's worth noting there are other significant buildings um, that have solar panels, for example, and others that lead the way. Clarence House has solar panels, has done for six, almost seven years. Buckingham Palace has solar panels. Um, my main concern was around the fact that it that this um, the proposed panels would only deliver a one point four percent reduction. It was raised several times, but I think I, I personally feel that's been addressed, and I'm grateful to have understood a little bit more about the measures that would work alongside that. So, like Councillor Bajant, I am moving towards supporting this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor I'll do the more speechy bit now <laughs> with my questions. So, like Councillor Collis, I was concerned when it said it was only 1.4. But actually, I feel in some way the college have undersold themselves a bit because it's actually providing 100% of the energy for that building. So, and in some ways, to their credit, they didn't try and greenwash it in that way. They've just been really honest about the whole estate, which actually gives me more confidence, I think, that things are happening. Which is why I also asked Toby and Mary to clarify that these measures that are raising objections, saying that this is the only thing they're doing, this isn't the case, they're doing other things as well. Um, I mean, I, for me, it's a really difficult decision because I do feel really strong. This is a beautiful building and I do not want us to do anything to damage it. So that's why I'm asking particularly about the waiting. Because for me, the thing that at the moment makes me feel favourable to voting for, uh, well, not refusing it, is that it is a very plain, practical roof. I think if these were really visible from everywhere, it would be a straight no for me. I agree with officers. But I've been walking around the town for many years. I went round again this morning to look at the views. I mean, obviously, it's scaffolded. But broadly, you can't see a huge amount. I also queried with officers, when you look on the Google map, the two sides of the roof are completely different colours. And I thought, oh, is that the clouds? But actually, it's different ages of lead. So we already have a a discrepancy there that I have to say I'd never noticed until I actually looked on Google Maps a few days ago. And I think the view from Great St Mary's is important, but Great St Mary's is already covered in solar PV, so to a certain extent, I'm not sure it's unreasonable to say that other buildings would be, and it is a limited amount of people who would see. I take Mary's point that there may be drones going over, but I mean, there may be drones going over when it's raining and the lead will look a different colour as well at the moment. So I am also, I know it's great to be an exemplar, but this isn't going to set a precedent because these are not really visible from many of the street scenes. That's a completely different thing to sticking them on something that's incredibly visible. So, yeah, I suppose I think I would be very comfortable, though. I would really like that condition to be strong, that if they are made redundant, i.e. they're not used, they need to be removed. And I certainly think if new updated ones are coming back through, they would need permission again, I understand, just because, you know, there's the possible damage to the fabric. I think that's the only thing I'd ask Christian is, is does he have any concerns about damage to the fabric from the installation of these? I'm, I'm thinking not. It's not raised in the report, but I'd be grateful if we could clarify that. And finally, if it were to be accepted, are we happy that a glint and glare condition could be added that would obviously address those concerns from the airport? Because I think... The difficulty when we have a refusal is we can't see the conditions attached, so you kind of can't see. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, I think the Blinton Blair thing is a given as far as I'm concerned. I would have thought that was fully possible. Um, so my two penny worth is, I mean, I think, you know, this isn't about save. Well, we have extreme weather events all around us all the time. It's not about saving money or saving carbon. It's about saving the world. And this is only a small part of it. I don't accept the argument that a small part means it's not useful. I, I think the 1.4% of carbon emissions at the college. Well, um, you know, we talked some time ago in Cambridge City Council about the carbon that we could save as a council, and it was a small percentage of the total carbon in the city. But it's still worth doing it, very much worth doing it. In fact, it, you've got to do it. And those small parts all contribute towards a bigger part around the world. You know, maybe the UK can only do so much, but it does what it can. So I don't accept that a small number is a number not worth trying to achieve. I, I think it is worth achieving. I also think there's, there's all sorts of public benefits here, one of which is the carbon. It's, uh, the, you know, the, the energy itself that can be um, produced for the college and for the national grid. But also the public benefit, I, I think, although it's an unbalanced decision, and I accept that completely the argument that seeing the solar panels on the roof may be an aberration to some people when they look. But on the other hand, some people will see that as a positive sign that we're moving forward in society with, you know, trying to do a, a good thing for the planet. And we have millions of visitors to this city every year who may see those panels. And I, I consider them seeing those panels to be a good thing. So um, I think, you know, considering that we've been told, I've been told by officers here that today that it's, it's an unbalanced decision that there's less than, less than substantial harm and that there is a benefit. I'm inclined to feel that the, the balance is that the benefit is, is greater than the harm. Anyone else? Sorry, Councillor Bennett. I think it's clear that as several of us are considering um, going against the officer's recommendation and that gives an issue in that we don't have a normal long list of conditions that we might have and we might want to impose on a building of this significance. I mean, we've mentioned the Glinton Blair assessment, but um, if this had been, uh, there'd been a recommendation for acceptance by the officers, I'm sure this would not have been the only condition imposed. So if we do decide to vote in favour of this application going ahead, is it possible for it to be remitted for the officers to have a chance to consider whether there are any conditions that are appropriate, or do we just have to go with the Clinton Glare assessment condition alone? Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Bennett. It's Toby's to respond to that. Thanks, Chair. I think if members are minded to support the proposal rather than support the officer recommendation. I think we would ask for delegated authority to draft conditions which we feel would be um, appropriate and agree those through chair spokes and vice chair. Um, one of those conditions would involve um, almost certainly some kind of decommissioning strategy at the 25 or 30 year mark, which is the um, predicted lifespan for the uh, panels themselves. The other condition that's been kind of referenced in relation to Glinton Glare, um, whilst I note the airport um, haven't provided any any further comment, certainly the applicants have addressed, addressed this point in additional consultation and they feel relatively strongly that a condition on Glinton Glare is not um, appropriate given that the panels are way outside the flight path of planes and the angle of the um, uh, panels would not cause glare to pilots and they, they cite other panels within this part of the town including the Guild Hall which haven't caused um, any concern for um, pilots the airport so I would I would ask if we get to that point that the discretion to append a Glinton Glare uh, condition is also left with officers, perhaps in further consultation with the uh, airport authorities. Thank you. Um, did everyone understand and agree with that? Okay, good, thank you. 
in that case, then, uh, are we ready to go to the votes? Yes? Yeah. Any more? Any more? No? Okay, so Toby, if you can give us the recommendation then, please. Thanks, Chair. So the recommendation is set out on page 131 of the officer report. That is to refuse planning permission for the reason as, as set out. Thank you, Chair. So all those in favour of refusal? None, Chair. All those against the recommendation of refusal? Six, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. That's unanimous. Maybe it's just going to explain a couple of things to you now in terms of what the next process is. Thanks, Chair. I know this may, may, may be repeating some of the comments that members have made, but given the significance of the heritage asset and the indications that members might be minded to support the proposal, I think it would be worth just members um, very briefly running, running through the balancing exercise in terms of um, the weight, the public benefit to be um, given um, to the scheme against the less than substantial harm that's been um, identified. And I just kind of read the relevant paragraph for, um, from the MPPF, which is paragraph, uh, is, well, two paragraphs, 199 and 200 are most relevant. Paragraph 200 says any harm to or loss of the significance of a designated heritage asset from its alteration or destruction or from development within its setting should require clear and convincing justification. And paragraph 199 says great weight should be given to the asset's conservation and the more important the asset, the greater weight should be. Paragraph 202 then says, where a development proposal would lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate, securing its optimum viable use. So I think um, um, some, just some, some assessment around then, around, around those issues, that balancing, and then please, I think we would need a member to um, move to make a recommendation, I'm assuming, to support the proposal. That will need to be seconded and then voted on. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Toby. So, I mean, I'd say concisely um, not very visible um, in terms of the panels that are proposed. I'd say that the public benefit is, is substantial in terms of the carbon reduction and also in terms of... of uh, I'm sending a message to other people all over the world that this is the thing to do, and um, and and why not? So, but that's maybe a secondary point. But certainly, in, I think in terms of not being very visible, but then also being able to derive a, a real and, and definite benefit. This is a huge roof. It's not just a small house. It's a huge roof. Has a lot of potential to, to generate electricity going forward and. And that's got to be a, a, a real public benefit. And yeah, that's that's my concise statement. Anyway, Councillor Porter. I think two of the reasons I went for were one that we can deal with the glint and glare issue through condition if needed. And secondly, because with the time limit to ensure, you know, this is a very old building that these may only be on there for a decade or two. So with the removal conditions, and I think particularly something also to say if they're redundant, so if they stop working after 10 years, they should be coming off. Um, and I think for me, the area of the heritage asset affected is the plain roof. I think it's described as plain and practical. That isn't as old as the rest of the building. There's already discrepancies on the two halves where it's been relayed at different times. So we've already got that contrast. You know, it's not as if we're sticking these on the par you know, on the beautiful stonework and I think as the chair said it is that the glimpses 
partly because it, it covers the whole roof. I would be more concerned if it was in chunks where you get odd looks where it doesn't match. But if you look at the plan, it's the whole roof. So when you look in, it will be a consistent view still. And whilst there is some visual changes from clouds, I think there are already some of those when it goes over the lead. So I think it would be, it could be incorporated sympathetically within the heritage asset, if that makes sense. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bajan. Yeah, I have absolute confidence in the officers to work out the detail on these things. Important to me, as you will have heard, is the significant message, far more important than the carbon saving, probably, that Cambridge will send by this act of... Well, I won't say that. But, but, but by this approach to this situation, it's the message. Yeah, I think you're quite right. And also, I think we can trust to a certain extent the applicants. They've looked after the building for hundreds of years. So there's no reason to suppose they won't continue to look after it well. And also, you know, lead is an eminently malleable material, both literally and metaphorically. So it can still be welded and repaired going forward, just as it has been over the hundreds of years already. So there's no reason to suppose that any bits that have been taken off can't be repaired. Councillor Dwarfett would. Uh, much as I appreciate what Councillor Bajant is saying, that this is a set will send a message we have to take care that this is providing an actual public benefit in terms of electricity generation especially when outweighing against any potential harm or any harms um, can i also say that in terms of ca carbon reduction on the on any conditions put in although i'm happy to leave it to the officers chair and spokes um, what you don't want to do is just assume that something isn't well you can replace a panel very easily and it's usually the inverters that go first not the panels um you know we don't know how long they'll last actually we say 25 years is the life but they might last a lot longer they don't weather you wash them they don't weather in cover. You keep them washed to make sure that they're working. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, let's wrap this up then, Councillor. Is any, any, Councillor Pora. Just to confirm, if you draft new conditions, are you happy to, to go to Chair, Vice Chair and Spokes? Would that be OK, Chair? I am. Yeah. Councillor Bennett. I just wondered on the question of public benefits, whether it's worth mentioning that presumably because excess uh, electricity is going to be generated above the chapel's requirements that will go on to King's estate, that this would help to relieve fuel poverty among King's College students, um, many of whom are, have been approaching our cost of living pop-ups for help. Um, I mean, helping uh, people in poverty is a very classic public benefit test and perhaps it's helpful to include here possibly yes Samson. thank you very much okay any more for any more no okay so what now toby chair a member needs to um put forward an alternative recommendation and that needs to be seconded then voted on okay so i i recommend that we uh, approve the recommendation that's my anyone want to second that Councillor Bajans, right, okay, so that's it. So we have a vote then. So all those in favour of the recommendations will approve the item. Thanks, Chair. Okay, that's unanimous then. And I think we're there, aren't we now then? Just those... Yeah, thanks, Chair. And I, I take it from the discussion that, in, that includes delegated authority for officers to draft conditions and consult Chair, Vice Chair and the spokes accordingly. Thank you. Okay, that's all done then. Thank you very much, Councillor. It was a good debate, and thank you to the speakers uh, uh, and, uh, who came and also the ones that gave statements. Thank you very much. Good debate. Okay, so that's that then. Um, do you want a couple of minutes before we do the last item? Yeah, okay. So if we just have a, two or three minutes then, and then we'll do the last item today. He's been patiently waiting. I'm sorry, sir. Okay, so um, come back at sort of about 25 past.
Okay, welcome back after a short break. So the last item of the day is item 10, uh, one near away. The presenting officer is, who is the officer? Uh, Nick Westlake. Nick Westlake. So Nick, hello Nick, good afternoon. So if you, uh, afternoon, we have Jay. one speaker, no, hang on. We've got a speaker and a statement, yeah. A speaker and a statement. So Oliver, are you, you Oliver? Yeah, hello, hi. And um, then a statement to be read out. So, yeah, okay, when you're ready then, Nick, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, fine, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, this application is a Section 73 variation of conditions application for an approved planning application number 17 forward slash 1894 forward slash FUL for the demolition of the existing garage and an erection of an attached dwelling and an extension to the existing house. The development is, is at number one, Mere Way in Cambridge. So just bear with, my screen is frozen. Um, okay, sorry, I think there was a slight, I think my mouse is operating as changing the slide rather than my uh, keyboard, but um, I'll get used to that. So, sorry about that, everybody. My, the location plan is shown before you. Uh, the reason for the call in to planning committee is that there are two objections from properties on Arbury Road to the north, and there is one letter of support from the immediate neighbouring property, number three, Mere Way. Um, there is a verbal update um, to the plans pack. The proposed plan on page 71 is actually an incorrect plan that needs to be ignored. It will be explained in this presentation. The, um, the plan shown on page 71 is actually the refused section 73 application in 2022, uh, but it shouldn't be overly complicated as I go through this presentation. Uh, the ward is um, Arby Ward, it's Flood Zone 1, and the original permission in 2017 is deemed as an extant permission, i.e. the development has commenced and that development could be built out. So the relevant site history is before you. At the top of the page is the most recent 2022 refused application. Um, that was a similar application to the host application before you today. Um, however, that was refused by virtue of its form, scale and mass um, that would result in an overly dominant form of development, giving rise to a significant harm to the appearance of the existing dwelling and character of the area, including the terrace within which is situated. Um, the unduly large bulk and domineering addition to the approved dwelling and the existing property the totality of the alterations proposed would constitute a poor standard of design that would have an unacceptably detrimental impact on the character and appearance of the host dwelling and wider area. The proposal was deemed not to be compliant with Cambridge local plan policies 55, 56, 57, 58 and 59. So this application effectively is an attempt to overcome that reason for refusal. Uh, at the bottom of the screen there in blue is an indication of the original extant permission from 2017. Um, pertinent to that application is the fact that the conditions at attached to that approval have uh, been discharged where required, namely conditions five, boundary treatment, surface water drainage and so on. Some images of the host site. This is an aerial view taken from Mere Way. Uh, the top right shows uh, an indication in a torch analogy as to where one is looking from the direction. So this is looking towards the application site and the foundations are present. And there is um, work being undertaken, which has been halted by the enforcement department. And the rationale behind that uh, halting of the work is that they are currently building out a footprint which is no, not currently approved. Um, 
originally when the work started they were building out obviously the um the 2017 approval um and the, that extant permission came into effect due to the demolition of the existing uh, or was uh, garage in that location so that's the current scenario on site um again another view looking across mere way in the in the background is arbury road you can see there are some outbuildings on the northern boundary in situ again this is uh, an aerial view the rear of the site uh, looking into the garden uh, clearly the foundations are visible um, and an indication of the scale to or the distance to the dwellings of arby road is 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 evident there is the factual figures are given in the report um, there is a slide and here is a slide um, 26 meters um, that's the rear building line of 235 Arbury Way, um, sorry, Arbury Road um, to the side boundary of the host site. Street view images. The um, image on the left is the most recent image. This shows obviously scaffolding in place. Um, image on the right, um, there is uh, no scaffolding there. That's That's a slightly earlier image but it gives you an idea of the, um, the spaciousness of that corner plot. Um, the host building is the gable-ended um, building, with, which is projects slightly forward of uh, the rest of the terrace. Um, and that's equally true for the uh, dwelling at the far end, um, which is number seven, uh, mere way. So they're bookended by two um, front gable projection projections and actual rear gable projections as well this is a view of the rear garden of the host site again uh, this is where development has commenced and has been halted um, there is a boundary uh, hedge that is uh, in in some places on the neighboring side of the uh, the red line and in some locations within the host site um, on the northern boundary um, this is a view uh, of looking across the um, rear of the site um, you can see the bookended nature of number one mere way and and on the far left there that's number seven mere way so they have a, a front and rear gable projection so this is the original 2017 approval um, the uh, the existing number one mere way is on the right um, so the dotted line and denotes the new dwelling, hipped roof, um, front projection with a pitched element, so not a gable end, not a brick finish, that's a, a tile finish with a, a recessed pitch. Um, you can see it here on the side elevation um, and in the background there, that is the, um, that's the, the, the gable end of number one mere way. And then in the bottom, left is the roof plan that was approved there's a, a slight technical error on that approved roof plan um, showing a gable end but that is now being rectified in this application floor plans for the 2017 approval before you um, the application in 2017 created a two-bedroom dwelling the um, host property number one uh, mere way became a three-bedroom dwelling both dwellings had one parking space, bike and bin stores to the front, um, and that was all approved at planning committee. So this is the current application. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very similar to the 2022 refusal. There is a slide further on that gives the precise alterations and I'll, show, I'll move on to that one. It's slightly easier to see the changes. Um, the proposed four plans here, these are probably the most relevant um, to take note of. The uh, proposed ground floor area on the left hand side shows the new dwelling, um, a larger kitchen area, um, stair, what stairwell on the side of the house. Um, there's also a small office space. Uh, at first floor level, um, the rear building line will be flush with the existing rear building line of number one mere way. 
um, and then we can see the proposed roof plan. So we have the gable end here of the number one mere way, um, and here we have a recessed pitched roof, um, which is slightly lower to the ridge than um, number one mere way. So an element of subservience there. Neighbouring property rear building line is shown. Um, so the application also involves a single storey rear projection for number one mere way. Garden sizes, um, a healthy garden size has been achieved for both the existing and proposed dwelling, um, circa 14 metres in depth um, and both circa 70 square metres in space to the rear. So this is the slide or several of the next two slides are the ones I think are probably most helpful for members. Um, essentially, what we have before you is the original 2017 approval, um, the 2022 refusal, and then the current application. So going from left to right at the top, this is the front elevation. So this was approved in 2017. Um, the application came in in 2022. It was refused. Um, the, the large, well, it's very similar to what was originally submitted. It's, it's marginally wider by, by some 40 centimetres. Uh, it's detailed within the report. Um, and then uh, this is the current application, front elevation, not too many changes. Rear elevation, this is where things are a bit more obvious. Um, this was approved in 2017. Um, the application came in refused in 2022 rear elevation um, and the key changes are in red. We've lost a uh, rear window for the WC in this location. Two obscure um, glass windows are still on the side of the house um, and the ridge of the uh, hipped roof element is slightly lower than what was originally submitted. So not vast changes, but the key changes are shown on this slide. Um, these are the side elevations. So the south side elevation, um, originally we didn't have uh, a south side elevation um, submitted in 2022. Um, nevertheless, for the refusal in 2000, and, sorry, 2017, the refusal in 2022, this, this slide shows the bulk of um, the first floor uh, massing that, that included um, the projection that was objectionable to the officer at that time. And then on this current application uh, on the south side, we don't see um, that extension at first floor level. Ditto um, for the north side elevation. So here we have the 2017 original approval. Um, in the centre location, we've got the 2022 refusal. Um, and then as we skip towards the current application, you can see the massing is now the same depth as one mere way at first floor. Um, so the rectangular white line there indicates the pitch roof um, of the gable end of number one mere way. So there's no extension at first floor level proposed on the new dwelling. Um, and also in the, in this area here, the um, circle indicates the slightly lower um, pitch um, or ridge. Uh, to finalise on the plans, um, again, another way of viewing those um, changes, ground floor uh, original approval, um, the 2022 refusal, and then the current application at ground floor, there's, large, there's very few changes. Um, Possibly most notably, the, uh, the stairwell is being um, put on the side of the house. Uh, but the key point of putting that slide in is that there wasn't a refusal in the 2022 application on impacts on residential amenity um, for the immediate neighbouring property or the neighbouring properties to the north. So this is a relevant slide. Um, and then equally, as we look at the first floor approved floor plans, this was the original 2017 approval. Um, this was the first 2022 refusal with the greater projection of first floor level, providing that additional mass and bulk, which unbalanced the uh, certainly the rear and side elevations of the terrace as a whole, thus objected to by officers. 
and this current application has obviously the first floor element removed um, and therefore officers um, are deemed uh, to support this application um, due to the reduction in mass bulk on uh, the, the rear projection of the new dwelling. Uh, so with regards to the key material considerations, um, they relate to the principle of the development that is accepted due to the extent permission on site, subject to uh, the impact upon the character and visual amenity of the area. Uh, in this instance, it's um, of officer's opinion is that the reason for refusal of the 2022 application has been overcome. The impact upon residential amenity is deemed acceptable. Uh, the distances to the immediate neighbouring properties to the north is a determining factor in that regard. And also the impact on number three, the immediate neighbour to the south is uh, on balance acceptable. There's been no objection from that neighbour. Indeed, that neighbour is actually written in in support of the scheme. Um, in terms of drainage implications, um, they would be uh, suitably covered by planning condition. Equally, highway safety and parking hasn't changed from the original 2017 arrangement, i.e. one dwelling, uh, sorry, one parking space per dwelling. Um, it wouldn't be deemed um, objectionable this time round. Uh, there are no uh, objections from internal consultees. There have been two letters of objection from third parties, and these are detailed in paragraph 7.2 of the report. Uh, those comments have been taken into consideration. Um, they're well articulated comments, um, but overall officers um, have weighed up the impact upon residential amenity, uh, visual uh, character um, in particular, and deem there to be uh, no significant objections and recommend the application to be approved subject to the conditions detailed in the committee report. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, uh, the speakers. So um, uh, we should have the statements of the objectors first, shouldn't we? So we'll have that first and the applicant after that. So if you want to read them out, then please, James. Statement on behalf of three households, 229 Arbury Road, 233 Arbury Road and 235 Arbury Road. The building work that has already commenced at One Mere Way predates the current application by some months and construction was started in April 2020. The northern wall of the building work is very close to the hedge that divides 233 and 235 Arbury Ray from One Mere Way. It is possible to put hand through the mature hedge and touch the wall. As the wall rises, the impact on the visual amenities in these gardens will be considerable. This will impact use of the gardens by a family with a small children and a very elderly couple in the late 90s. As building commenced without planning permission, we assume that their that their required building regulation checks of footings and foundations had not been undertaken. Thus, the extremely close proximity of this building to the neighbouring properties where small children are playing and elderly people are gardening or simply sitting is a major cause for concern. The whole project is grossly overbearing and does not accord with other properties in the area. Comparison with the extension of 239 Arbury Road is invidious. That house was always a four bedroom property with a garage built in the 1960s on a double plot by the constructor for his own use. While there have been several extensions and extra houses built at the end of the terraces along Mere Way, none have been of these dimensions with the potential to impact the privacy and security of neighbours. The planning permission originally granted for this site, 17 stroke 1894 stroke FUL, in January 2018 was very much in accordance with these. We are further concerned that the breach of condition notice of May 2022 has not been complied with, as the park constructed building and all associated materials remain in place. Statement ends. Right, thanks James. Um, so Oliver, do you want to speak in the microphone thing over there? Look, if you um, sit right there, thank you. So you've got three minutes to speak, and if you press the button on it on the right-hand side, it should light up, and then half a minute before the end, the bell will go to let you know it comes to the end. All right. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. So I would like to address this in, in three minutes in three areas. The first area is actually my commitment that I follow the procedures and processes set up by planning 
in order to achieve the acceptable design that I can progress and develop. So I have approached the planning and requested, you know, I've been recommended to, to, to follow the uh, consultation, which I have actually paid fee for, but I did not get expected, you know, outcome because I was more getting the conflict, conflicting message rather than kind of supporting. So then I've taken additional approach and effort to talk directly to the planning officers to try to resolve the matters that are actually refusing the previous applications. Uh, and this has taken me significant amount of the time, uh, considering the COVID and everything else, I could never come to the agreement of what I need to do in order to make it acceptable. So as you're looking at the timeline, uh, I've made this approach, keep changing, keep with different applications. And now I came to the stage where I believe I have addressed everything what was demanded by, by planning officers. Regarding the objections, um, so I've, I'm aware that objections have been raised purely from a number 220, sorry, uh, 229 uh, Arbury Road. Uh, and, and these objections are kind of, uh, I, I feel it more against me than against the proposed development. I've tried my best to incorporate all the comments through the objections. Uh, and how can I say, and, and this has been agreed with the planning officer. So I have made sure that there is no impact or there are no changes to the front elevation. There is no impact on the proposed approved parking. There is no impact on amenity because of the distance. There is no side windows. The only changes I'm proposing are to the rear of the property. And the reason for these changes, they've been enforced by kind of changing the life that people live since we have a COVID. In my profession, expectation is that, you know, some of the time you will be working from home. So I needed the office in order to accommodate the office and sufficient kitchen space. I needed to kind of increase the size of this property on, on the ground floor. And uh, I've tried, okay, sorry, that's, that's all, thank you. No. Keep going, you still got 30 seconds. Left. Microphone on, yeah, that's it. Sorry. Carry on, Oliver. It's all right, not ending so, yet. I, I, I've, I think I've made the best effort to kind of to satisfy all policy, all policies. Um, this will enable me to work from home, to reduce the footprint as I don't need to travel to work. You know, I have sufficient kitchen so that I can have a kind of, you know, I don't need to eat outside and travel. Uh, so I think the changes that I'm requesting are minimal. The initial plan was not put forward by me because I purchased this property in 2018, move, moving as a professional to Cambridge. So, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Oliver. If you want to turn the microphone off, please, just press the button, it should go off. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, uh, that's all the speakers. So, debate. Councillors. Councillor Gawthrop Wood. Um, could the officer just show us the internal layouts? There was a slide he showed earlier, because I'm getting a bit confused between 2017, 2022, the latest plans and what I have in the um, plans sent out. Thank you. All right, thank you. So um, I'll collect up a couple of questions, perhaps first, Nick, before we go back to you. Uh, Councillor Cora. Um, thanks. I just wanted to check. I know um, for some reason the boundary condition condition was discharged when they hadn't actually built the boundary. So are we satisfied that the new condition 13 and 14 will cover that? I also wanted to check um, access to the garden because I think the existing house doesn't have garden access when this is built out from the front and that the new subservient dwelling, it'd be interesting to know the width around the side. It looks quite tight. But I think I've understood correctly that there is rear access down a lane for things like bins, but I'd just be grateful if that could be clarified. Um, and also, if the current building is bigger than the footprint, so i.e. the concrete that's already down and shown in the slides, it, 
are we satisfied that that will be removed or do we need a condition to make clear that if the building line has reduced i'm not sure if it has on the ground floor entirely but just be grateful because obviously we'd rather have grass and concrete if we can thank you thank you councillor so i wasn't quite clear nick you said about the map at the start not being the right map but i wasn't quite clear what what the correct map was and also just on that point of the applicant already starting uh, work on the site before having had planning permission for this building project. Um, it seems to me that if the walls are going to go in a different place, they'll need the foundations in a different place, because you can't build walls on nothing. There needs to be a foundation, and that's not a piece of concrete. That's a one meter deep. So I'm not quite clear how that all works, Nick, in terms of what will, will happen going forward should we give permission today. OK, back to you then, Nick. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, well, let's, I'll deal with that first point there in relation to uh, the, the footings. The footings are clearly um, the footings being proposed before you today. So as things stand, um, they are building out a development they don't have planning permission for. Um, however, the 2017 approval became extant um, when there was the demolish, demolishing and removal of the uh, garage that was once there. That triggered the commencement of that application. So that is, if you like, extant in the bank, they can build that out. Um, if they so wish. If we are, or if members are minded to support this application, then um, in theory, there wouldn't be a breach of planning because they are building out effectively the ground floor plan before you on the left hand side of this screen. Um, they've been made to stop works because the development was not in accordance with the 2017 approval. Uh, so that that eventuality would fall away in the event of this application being supported by yourselves. In terms of um, the gap to well, sorry, in terms of the plan, the correct plan um, that, that was that was on page 71 of the plan pack, um, there was unfortunately a very a relatively small window to get this application to committee. Um, it had been passed from several officers and then to myself. Um, and um, regrettably, um, the 2022 uh, floor plans were put on that plan pack rather than the plans before you now. They're very similar, um, but the only obvious, well, the key difference being that the first floor um, is actually as shown on this uh, slide, i.e. flush with the existing dwelling, number one, mere way. So there is no projection further back. Um, and that was the fundamental objecting aspect to the 2022 refusal. So in that way, um, officers are content that uh, the reason for refusal in the 2022 section 73 application has been overcome. And it is also fair to say there has been a lot of dialogue between the original officer and the applicant um, over email and, and over phone, which certainly the emails I've been privy to that does concur with the, um, uh, the, the comment made by the applicant that there has been positive dialogue to overcome these concerns. So that's that's certainly a true comment. Um, in terms of there being a narrow gap um, to the side of the building line and the boundary to the north, that is true. Um, the original approval also had a relatively narrow gap. So if we go back to the original approval, this is the original approval 2017. Now I've measured this. Um, the uh, it, it's 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 approximately um, four. Well, I I I don't have the measurement before me, but I believe it was 600 mil. 
Um, and I know for a fact that this one is 300 mil um, because I've certainly measured that one. Um, and therefore, there is going to be, um, one would say, no opportunity for individuals to gain access to, unless, well, no realistic opportunity, let's put it that way, for individuals to gain access to the rear of the property from the front um, because of the 300 mil gap, 30 centimetres, um, where before it was wider. Um, now, that aspect was on the 2022 refusal. It wasn't refused on those grounds, i.e. the width of the overall width of the ground floor being excessive. Um, I believe I put in the planning report that it would be feasible to close that gap um, to some extent through an outbuilding. Um, if it was close to the boundary in this instance, you could build uh, with a roof up to 2.5 metres in height adjacent to that boundary. So there are scenarios where um, that gap could be enclosed um, and equally a single storey side extension could be achieved under permitted development. So. Um, the overall blocking up of that gap could happen um, through permitted development rights of the existing host dwelling. Um, therefore, uh, on balance, officers haven't objected to the narrowness of the gap um, to the side boundary. Uh, in terms of bins and bikes storage, both of those are being provided to the front of the site. So we can see the bottom left um, with the bins and the bikes are both present to the front, but that was also the case on the 2017 approval where we can see a bin store and bike store again at the front of the property. So this is the 2017 approval. Um, and for that reason, um, officers are minded to support um, the, 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 the footprint. Um, but it, it, it was a good point um, raised um, by, by the councillor there. Um, in terms of Boundary conditions, um, yes, the 2017 application has had its boundary treatment condition approved. Equally, it's had its um, landscaping condition approved. Interestingly, that landscaping condition only spoke of the front elevation, so didn't talk about the rear elevation. Um, therefore, because um, this application changes the, um, the the line or the linearship of the rear garden arrangement. The plots are changing. The, um, the plot sizes are changing subtly in the in the rear garden. As a result of that, and also as a result of the change footprint, the original 2017 conditions um, would fall away in the event of this application being committed because of those uh, fundamental changes and therefore they would need to be reapplied. So we would then have full control over the discharge of conditions again in the event that the applicant wanted to build out this application before you. Um, putting the controls back into officers' hands to ensure um, suitable boundary treatments um, and landscaping to the front and it has to be made clear that the landscaping is to the front but the boundary treatments would incorporate um, an assessment of what would happen on the northern boundary um, there is a hedge on the northern boundary part of that hedge is within the ownership of the applicant uh, other parts of that hedge are within the ownership of the neighbours so um, members may wish to um, seek a condition um, to keep the hedge on the applicant side. Um, it needs to be made clear that that is not currently in the list of conditions. And part of the rationale behind that is that it wasn't within the 2017 list of conditions. Um, and it wasn't it could be deemed as part of the uh, boundary treatment ap uh, condition application, but you could also have a standalone condition to keep the hedge um, on the applicant side. But on balance, officers have decided against that, um, given it wasn't included in the 2017 approval. But we have got a uh, hedge maintenance plan 
as part of the application to ensure the neighbour's hedge um, will be considered during the build out um, and hopefully uh, protected fully. Um, and there was one other question in terms of uh, building lines um, being reduced. Um, I think that was covered in the discussion on the footprint of the building, um, i.e. they are currently building out um, the the two the, the the application before you. Um, so if this was approved, that would be acceptable. They can they can carry on with that. If this was refused, for example, then they would have to either resubmit a new application or go back and build out the 2017 approval, in which case remedial works would need to take place to what they've constructed already. And that is achievable. Um, and they would have to do that. Enforcement officers will be there to in ensure that's carried out. I hope that's answered all of those questions, but by all means come back if it hasn't. With any further questions. Well done, Nick, and thanks for all your work. So, um, just one question. It wasn't quite clear to me. I must have misunderstood. But you seem to be saying at one stage there's not access to the back gardens from the front. Is that correct, or am I? Did I mishear you? There's no access. Well, there, 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 there is no realistic access. I, I mean, there is a there is a 300 mil gap. So this is the ground floor plan. Um, so on the left hand side. Um, they put the boundary in, so the gap between the the flank wall and the boundary is 300 mil. Um, as a result of that, I don't think it's feasible for an individual, certainly an adult, um, to gain access. It's, there is a gap, but it's extremely narrow. So it's 30 centimeters when before it was 60, and 60. Is is possible? I believe that is um, that's the minimum width that you'd need if you had electrical goods on the side. On the I got you, Nick. I understand. So that means you have to go through the house to get to the back garden, so like a terrace, basically. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Goldthorpe Wood. Councillor Pora mentioned a path at the back, and it's not too clear whether that does give access. Um, I also wondered. There do seem to be some informatives uh, and conditions on energy use and EV charges. Uh, just wanted to check that was, you know, that was the case. Uh, in fact, it seems to repeat things in the informative that's in the conditions. Um, is, the, is there an issue in terms of maintenance of the house having only a 30 centimetre gap? between the boundary and the, um, well, it's the new loo on the new build part. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? Councillor Porro. Just to echo, I think my reading is that there is a path at the rear of the garden. Um, certainly it's chosen the plan that there's an access, but obviously I don't know if they own that or have rights. I'm interested why we don't have a biodiversity net gain condition, um, because this is a new application as assessed under the new local plan. And I, I mean, I would like to protect the hedge if possible. I appreciate if it's not um, protected in another way. I'd certainly like a biodiversity net gain condition so that we can take account of the biodiversity that's there. And if the hedge were to be damaged, that that should be replaced. Because obviously, in effect, this is a subdivision of a garden and we do look at biodiversity gain and things for that. So I don't know if um, the officer would consider accepting either a hedge protection one and or biodiversity net gain. Thank you, Councillor. Nick? Yes, thank you, Councillor. So, um, some good points. Um, the Firstly, I, um, I haven't been made aware of there being a path at the back. Um, that, that, that's, that's, that's my knowledge of that. I've, I've, I haven't been made aware that that is there. Um, so that's, that's all I can really say on that. Um, Looking at this photograph, there does appear possibly to be a path, um, a, a, an access way, um, but uh, I, I, I stand corrected. Maybe the um, applicant could confirm or otherwise if that's the case. Um, but in terms of 
the informatives um, and the overlap with the conditions, um, yeah, this this tends to happen when there is um, a, a condition that talks about, for example, sustainable energy, um, and there are elements to a sustainable energy planning condition that could involve, for example, air source heat pumps, um, or, or or could involve, um, or we have another one here in terms of the um, ele electrical charging point. Um, so they really furnish the condition with more information They're there to inform the applicant of um, other legislation um, that could uh, be pertinent to that particular condition. Um, so it's not unfamiliar for there to be an informative that 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 broadens out the scope of a uh, specific condition. Um, it keeps the condition concise and um, uh, and not overly wordy, um, but that's that's well spotted um, certainly. Um, in terms of maintenance to the side, that's a good a, a good uh, comment as well. Um, it's it, it would be. Um, it would be achievable. You could you could achieve maintenance to the site, for example, clearing block block drains, etc. Um, it is mainly just the toilet area that is uh, a single story um, that it, that has that very close relationship with the boundary. Um, I think the stairwell um, and the dining room area. There's a there's slightly wider gap, um, circa 500 600 mil. So I think those elements could be um, accessed without too much difficulty. Um, but yeah, the, the hip row single story element of the toilet, um, it is achievable. Um, there, there, there is there is a boundary hedge on that side. Um, uh, I think um, with, with, with given this, given this, given the, the depth of it, um, I think one would be comfortable if it's a, it's a brick finish um, that that could be achieved. Um, that's my personal opinion. And in terms of the biodiversity net gain, yes, absolutely. I understand what you're saying in, in, in those regards. Um, there was a comment put within the report that um, um, that, that, that spoke of um, the the impact of this development um, on biodiversity um, with the hedge condition. But yes, um, a biodiversity net gain planning condition um, can be stipulated. Um, of course, that that's um, uh, that that was correctly um, brought into the, the discussion, and I'm I'm happy to accept that for sure. Okay, right. So that we'll add that, that then. Nobody's spoken against it. I, I don't think you said anything, Nick, about the um, EV charging. So it's a new property, isn't it? So would it get an EV charger? Yes, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the the existing dwelling um, doesn't have that requirement. Um, that is within condition, just bear with 20. Um, it's there already, right, OK. Yeah. So, Councillors, are you all happy with those answers to your questions? Councillor Fulford, Wood, Councillor Power, yeah. Uh, I yep. think the applicant was indicating that there was rear access. I know the planning officer asked him to clarify, but I don't know whether you'd be willing to let him confirm that or not. No, not really. I don't think we need to. So anything else, councillors? Obviously, better to build the building after planning permission rather than before, but we are where we are. So, councillors, I think we're ready for the vote. So, Toby, do you have a recommendation, please, including that one that was just added on? Thanks, Chair. So the recommendation is set out on page 148 of the officer's report. That is to approve, subject to the planning conditions as set out, and subject to an additional condition with regard to biodiversity net gain. Thank you. For those in favour of the recommendation. Six, Chair. It's unanimous, so that's um, approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, councillors, for your time and patience this afternoon. Longish meeting, but we got there in the end. So thank you, and officers too. So thanks, Nick. And um, yeah, until the next time.